<laughs> All right. Well, um, and my voice is my voice okay at good level? Yep. Okay. So my name is Christine Larson, and I'm going to be one of the instructors today. So welcome. Um, and thank you for coming to our short course on GNSSIR. Um, so this is my first time doing this. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, we'll do our best. Uh, but if there are any problems, please let us know via Slack if you can. Uh, if there are problems or, um, or Zoom chat, I guess, but we'll turn that on and off depending. But primarily, we hope to use Slack. So let me try to share the screen and get started. Um, there we go. All right. So can you guys let me know if you can see that? Everything's okay? Hey, there's Jim. All right, so, <laughs> okay. Um, so we have five sessions. We're gonna try to put, um, <clears throat> excuse me, breaks between every session, probably session four and five. We'll run together, because session five is really just a, an opportunity for people to ask questions, uh, talk about the future and so on. Uh, please try to ask questions via Slack if you can. If you can't, um, any other mechanism you can think of, that'd be fine. You can unmute yourself if you're on Zoom and ask questions as well. Um, so uh, the way we're gonna do this is I'm gonna take the first session and the second session, there'll be a break between them. My goal is just give you an overview of the kind of things that you can do with GNSSIR, then the break, and then I'll talk a little bit about the software tools. My assumption is that you've watched the videos and or uh, done the homeworks enough that you know what I'm talking about when I go into session two. And then we'll have practical sessions. I'm gonna be working with Kelly Enlow on this. She's made all the Jupyter, no, no, excuse me, Jupyter Notebooks. And Tim Dittman has helped with the code as well. And he's um, been working very hard on getting those Dockers for people that are using the Docker implementation. Um, Tim, do you wanna say anything about the poll? Uh, uh, yes, I think, did Melissa okay. just launch that for us? It looks like. Is that showing up on everyone else's screen, I should say? Oh, okay. <laughs> Looks Wait. like it, yeah. I've, I've seen people okay. already answer. Okay. So yeah, there's a poll here. It's very simple. We're just curious. We just want to get some feedback on now having gone through everyone, having gone through their installations, what they ended up using. And you can select multiple things here if you're experimenting with multiple versions of the build, so. Okay. Um, you know, I, it's one thing to write, a software package, it's another thing to get it so that people can easily install it. So we want to, you know, do that well. And we've definitely learned a lot um, by getting this code together for you. All right, so I've got this thing on my front of my screen. So let me try to move it. <laughs> Maybe there's a little hide button. Yeah, there probably is. I'm kind of, I'm new to Zoom. You guys will laugh at that, but. That's sort of the way it is for me. Um, so thank you to Kelly and Tim and also Kathleen, Melissa and Christine uh, with a C who helped on this co coding and um, short course. I also wanna thank the people that built GNSSIR. It was a long process, uh, wasn't one person. Uh, there are probably five more people I could add to this. And these are just the ones that were primarily based in Colorado or worked with me in Colorado. All right, now we're at the front page. An introduction. Let's get rid of that. And I'm gonna make your faces go away if I can. Mm, if I know how to do that, well, forget it. All right. So the caveats on this talk are that I'm gonna assume you watch the videos and I, I know that's a big assumption, but it lets me spend more time on practical applications at GNSSIR. And um, I think you can always go back and get the background videos later, but I'm gonna try here uh, to give you results. And I'm gonna try to show you that accuracy assessments have been done for these products. And I'm gonna try to point you to papers so that if you do want those details, you can um, get them. But first, let's start out with why would you do GNSSIR? Oops, there we go. Uh, well, it's an in-situ sensor. So if you believe you have a science application where you need in-situ sensors, 
Uh, this is a possibility for you. Uh, some other in-situ sensors have very small footprints. For example, soil moisture sensors often have tiny footprints. And any instrument can be expensive to maintain depending on how it's installed. I think it's the wish of many, many people to have satellites measure everything for them so that they don't need in-situ sensors. Uh, but the reality is satellites can have very large footprints and they don't always work uh, in some conditions. And so they're the potential for GNSSIR is to provide additional data with a different kind of footprint. Christine, it doesn't look like it's advancing on my side. Okay, that doesn't happen. So is it a white screen? No, I'm just still seeing Kelly and Tim's pictures. <laughs> so uh, inadvertently, I, um, I think I hit the something bad. So does it, can you see it now? I see the why would you want to measure environmental signals? And then nothing else? How about that? Yeah, now it's advancing, now it's advancing. Okay. Okay, now I think the thing is I shouldn't touch this gray bar ever. Can you see my caveats? Yes. Can you see supplement other in-situ sensors? Yes. Okay, all right, I apologize. I must have touched that thing. I'm sorry, I'm not very experienced with Zoom. <laughs> so I said these things, but you didn't see the words. Thank you for telling me. So the other big thing for uh, GNSSIR is uh, environmental scientists need in-situ data for a satellite validation and hydrologists need it for assimilation. Um, in some cases, the combination of the normal positioning products from GNSS combined with the reflections is really essential for doing good science. So there is, a, there is an application and a need for some of these things. Um, and in some cases, existing GNSS datasets can be used. And it's certainly true that in the beginning, I emphasized that a lot when I would talk to people about this method. But the reality is you can do it on purpose. You can deploy a GNSS instrument and you can make sure it can do positioning and reflections well. The idea that you're gonna be able to use all these GNSS datasets that exist, uh, it's exciting when you can do it, but you can't do it everywhere. So. That's another message I'd like to get through to people is you can't do it everywhere. So the how briefly, you guys are probably tired of seeing this slide, but it's my attempt to uh, show you the physics behind this. Basically you have a direct signal coming in from a single satellite received. Can you guys see my finger moving the little arrow? Okay, so the antenna receives that direct signal, which I'm showing you as a nice little blue sine wave. And there's a planar surface below the antenna, uh, this is a vertical view, and the reflected signal travels an additional distance, which is shown here in red. And it's just your plain old interferometer that you learned about freshman year. There's an interference pattern generated by this reflected signal and the direct signal. Reflected signal is much weaker, but it's still visible in signal power data, which is what we're using. I say here GPS signal, but it's an old slide. This is true for all the GNSS signals. Um, these are just uh, sample interference patterns that are created. But a, just something to make this clear, uh, it's not an instantaneous measurement. Uh, you have to wait as that satellite rises or sets to generate these interference patterns. So uh, that's something to keep in mind as well. It's not instantaneous. It takes a, a few minutes, sometimes 20 minutes, to get enough interference fringes so that you can detect what you want, which is the distance between this antenna and the planar surface. And the footprint itself depends on, let me try to make that small. Uh, the footprint depends on this H and it also depends on the elevation angle. All right. Um, can you see that? Are you guys seeing uh, we use SNR data? Guys? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Yes, I'm just a little paranoid now. I've turned off your faces. <laughs> so I, uh, okay. So one thing that's distinct about GNSSIR compared to positioning is we're going to use signal strength data. I'm just going to call it SNR data, signal to noise ratio. This is a typical pattern for a two meter tall antenna. That's the rising satellite arc. That's the setting satellite arc. Time is on the X axis. The direct signal, if you want to call it that, I'm no longer going to show you all the signing noise. it's just basically a polynomial. It's really dull and boring. 
And that's what makes it easy to remove just a simple polynomial. We're gonna emphasize the rising satellite and the setting satellite arc reflection um, patterns, which are shown here. These are these interference patterns I've been talking about. And the frequency of those interference patterns tell you H. All right, so without getting into the details, it doesn't work everywhere. And that, the reason it doesn't work everywhere, there are a couple of reasons, but one is that planar surface matters. And um, it can matter if it's metal versus snow versus soil and so on. And it can also could depend on roughness. Uh, people ask me how rough, how big, all these things are part of the discussion. Uh, if you watch the videos, you know that most of what I showed you for successful sites were large flat areas around an antenna, 20 meters in radius around the antenna, maybe even larger. So even though you might have a local planar feature near your antenna, if it's not large enough, you won't be able to generate these interference patterns. So uh, I put these up for fun, but basically uh, before you think about using GNSSIR, you'll wanna have to, you wanna think about, am I surrounded by planar features and also whether it's rough. And here are three places where you can do GNSSIR, i.e. you can measure soil reflections, ice reflections, and water reflections, but it would most certainly fail in these uh, particular examples. So I would also emphasize it has to be locally planar, but it, you can restrict azimuths. So it could not work in some azimuths and, and then it could work in others. So um, that's the, the main thing is that it doesn't always work, but you can often find some parts of it that do work. You can also have bad geodetic sites, which are bad reflection sites. I'm not gonna talk about those, but I would also say we have many geodetic sites that just don't work for reflections. So this one here, to me, that's not locally planar. It doesn't look as rough as the ones I showed you before, but it certainly has undulations that I don't like. This one is a good geodetic site, um, but it, it's, it's not a nice flat surface below the antenna. But this one's too short and I hate trees. So if you wanna take something away from this uh, 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 presentation, um, trees uh, obstruct signals and they don't allow you to see the reflection from the soil surrounding the antenna. This one has an actual man-made um, obstruction. So all of these can make it difficult to use GNSSIR. But I prefer, I think I said this in one of the videos, I prefer to look at this as a glass half full rather than half empty. There are lots of sites where it works and this is the site that we used as our test site in Boulder, Colorado. Um, we used it primarily in the beginning to test out ideas for using GNSSIR for terrestrial hydrology. Um, the three main targets we had and we were soil moisture, snow depth, and biomass. The first one we started with is soil moisture, and that drove a lot of our uh, initial efforts. Then it happened to snow, so we ran out with receivers and did some additional studies, and vegetation was a bit of a, um, what's the right word, accident. So anyway, our first results were in 2008. This is for Boulder, Colorado. What's shown here on the x-axis, day of year, you can see that there were these precipitation events in blue. So here it's shown as rain. Uh, we, apologies, uh, we were planning to do this study. So we had purchased soil moisture sensors. We had buried them in the soil and set up telemetry for them and so on. Uh, so this gray range, we had five sensors at the soil surface. I'm plotting the range of those soil moisture sensors. And what's shown in colors are the uh, estimates from GPS. And the different colors are just different satellites. Now we're gonna get away from that later, but in the beginning, we were just trying to understand what was going on and making sure that we understood which satellites were measuring when. And there was a very high correlation between these two. Uh, then in 2009, uh, it snowed in Boulder, we're not, you know, in the high Sierras or anything. Uh, we don't get meters and meters of snow, but we get often 10 to 20 centimeters of snow. Uh, this happens to be one of those uh, snow uh, storms. 
where the peak snow depth was say 25 centimeters. Uh, what's shown in these uh, dark red squares were the estimates of snow depth we made for different satellites. Here I gave up on using different colors, but um, there also you see some hand measurements. That means these diamonds were humans, went out and collected snow depth along a transect. And then there were some nearby sensors measuring snow depth. Uh, this was in the original publication, so I kept them there. But they're also valuable because if you see here three different colors, that's three different sensors of um, measuring snow depth in the same field, and they're getting different answers. And that's something you need to think about uh, when you make measurements that are in situ, you have to think about what's the area over which you're averaging. Well, the GPS is averaging over basically the entire field. These particular snow depth sensors were measuring different parts of the field over very small footprints. So that's something when you do these kinds of um, comparisons and they don't agree exactly, you have to always ask yourself, are they measuring the same thing, right? Um, and that's something just in the, to keep in your mind. Now, the next thing we looked at in 2010, this was pretty much, uh, I think this is an advertisement for GPS networks having interesting statistics on their website because really this vegetation statistic came out of some data I saw posted by UNAVCO, also IGS does it, UREF. Um, they were measuring something called pseudorange noise, which is one of the GPS signals. This is not SNR data, but they were measuring this in a way that let them say the network was working or the receiver seemed to be failing. And um, I had to reverse the sign, but it always seemed to peak in the summer when the um, vegetation grows in the Western US. So I'm not talking about California so much, but in places where it snows, vegetation grows in the summer. And uh, I worked with uh, Eric Small and other ecologists to download these NDVI data, which is an optical remote sensing data set that would tell us something about plant growth that's a quote, normal ecology metric. And there was a really strong correlation between them uh, in you know, the Rocky Mountain region of the Western US. And you can also see some things. I mean, you can convince yourself that the NDVI, which is an optical measurement, comes before, the peak comes before the GPS. And there's a reason for that. So that was our third observation for the, from these data. And sort of armed with that, we decided to try to take on the Plate Boundary Observatory, which had been planned you know, for over a decade, I guess, by that point, to uh, use data from this new initiative, which had over a thousand GPS receivers. The locations are shown in these uh, blue cyan circles. I think red are, what are red, Tim? Those are the, uh, they're not PBO, but they're other GPS sites. I can't remember now. Um, I think they are cooperating sites, perhaps. Um, yeah, maybe a, another network contributing. Yeah, I know. another network. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> time has passed on and we can't remember anymore. Um, anyway, we had these ideas at the same time the Plate Boundary Observatory was being built. So this was a source of data that was supposed to be used to estimate crustal deformation, which I'm showing here on the right. But the idea we had, and this again was with Eric Small and John Braun and Valeria Zavarotny was to try and make environmental products from the same data sets. Um, and we called that PBO H2O. And it basically gave us an opportunity to try and do this on a broad scale. Uh, I showed you our initial studies for snow and soil moisture for a single site. For one, well, I don't know, three, three rainstorms and two snowstorms. And uh, so we went whole hog and decided to try to do that for hundreds of sites um, for years, just to see if we could do it. So I'm gonna show you the three products we came up with. I'm not gonna show you a lot of them. I'm really only gonna show you one per site. Uh, the one I usually use here is in Idaho and I show it because uh, I have a video. So let's see if it works. Yeah, 
So this was one of our validation sites. And what's shown on the top are the photographs that we took of that pole right there. And we, um, my friend Evan, he put them together and um, stitched them together with our estimates from the GPS. So let's show that again. Um, and basically what you're seeing is snow is rising and we're measuring that with the GPS interference patterns. And uh, we have the digital image. So we're gonna try to read off the snow level from those digital images. And from that, we see very good correlation. We don't see perfect correlation, remember? In that early uh, comparison with in situ, other in situ data sets, we don't see perfect comparison, but we definitely see, they see the same snowstorms and so on. And basically armed with those algorithms we developed in Boulder, uh, we were able to eventually, uh, when we operated this network measure up until 2018, and then later on, we uh, were able to examine the earlier data. We also did an installation in Niowat Ridge, which is nearby. This is the uh, more traditional way of measuring snow depth for climatology studies isn't to take a photograph. Um, what they actually do is uh, they dig snow pits and they read these visually and, and mark them down. They usually go up there, I think every two weeks. And this is our colleague, Mark Williams. Um, and he'd been measuring this snow, I shouldn't call it a snow field, but he'd been measuring this field for decades to look at changes in uh, snow depth and snow water equivalent. So again, this is not gonna measure the same thing as this pole, but it's gonna give us something to give us a sense of whether we have a proper correlation. And in fact, we do, and this is one of, what I'm showing here in red is the manual pole measurement and blue is the GPS IR. Uh, Kelly's gonna show this to you, it's also online. Uh, so you can reproduce it yourself. The people at Niwat Ridge have a really nice set, data set, or sorry, a really nice uh, website that provides this in situ data so that you can do this comparison yourself. All right. Uh, for soil moisture, we ended up doing that at about 150 sites. Uh, this is probably the star of our site. It's in uh, eastern New Mexico. Uh, for GPS sites that had MET sensors, uh, we collated that data and plotted it here. It was a bit of a reality check so that when it rained, you could see that soil moisture did increase. In fact, uh, we also downloaded the NLDAS, which is the North American Land Data Assimilation System, I think is what it is. So it's not an in-situ measurement, it's a modeled um, data set. Uh, but again, it is helpful for getting a concept of what's going on here. Uh, these are the dry downs. Uh, these are daily points at this uh, site. And then vegetation we had at the most sites. Um, probably the reason we had the most was it's, um, it's um, self-normalized, it isn't based, it doesn't have units that hydrologists would use, a hydrologist would uh, volumetric soil moisture. We made sure to put that in the right units, same with snow depth and SWE. This is actually normalized GPS units. Um, NDVI, which uh, ecologists use, is, is normalized from zero to one, so they're, they're used to that normalization, but it's very carefully uh, defined relative to this, um, uh, to color, uh, the typical product you get is every 16 days. Uh, for GPS, it's gonna be available every day. We ended up using an amplitude change uh, and showed it as a percentage. The main thing here and the reason I, when I pointed out that the NDVI was before the GPS vegetation metric has to do with water. NDVI is optical, it doesn't know about water in the plants directly, whereas GPS doesn't know about color, it does know about water. Uh, this is a site in California. Uh, again, we did download the NDVI. Here are the GPS metrics. Uh, you can see here there was a very sharp green period, but that's uh, a low water year. The GPS shows you it's a low water year. Here is a low water year as well. We downloaded and plotted those precipitation stats so that people could get a context for that. But at the end of the day, the goal is that scientists could use these data either for doing satellite validation 
or in this case, we did our own study where we looked at changes in um, vegetation water content in the, uh, the plants uh, using only our own data. And in this case, we basically call, pick this color here between cyan and light blue. That's sort of like an average year in California. Um, gosh, now this is getting dated, but there was this huge <laughs> drought, uh, three-year drought in California, really, between 2012 and 2014, um, which was preceded by some pretty wet years and then recovered by 2015. But we looked at those changes over time and compared them to uh, rain records and things like that. So if you are interested, that is possible to look at. So uh, just finishing up the PBO H2 timeline, I don't wanna make a special uh, call out to Mike Willis, just so kindly gave us a place to archive the portal when the project was done. And also my computer had died. And so <laughs> I needed some place to host it. So thank him very much for that. So I'm gonna use that snow depth record I had to kind of give you an idea of what PBO H2O did. Um, and, it, and part of it is to give you context for this software as well as the science. So we did our test cases here in the late 2010s, 2008, 9, 10. We began PBO H2O in 2012. Uh, it was renewed uh, by NSF, but it was renewed specifically with the, uh, well, what shall I say? Uh, it was renewed and we were told to finish up because we'd shown that it worked and that at this point it needed to be transferred to um, uh, an organization that does operational work. So let me see, I've done that. So uh, the other thing is they, we offered uh, to analyze the older data. So we did that and I've, I've shown you this. Uh, uh, per their suggestion, we wrote a grant to NASA and got the funds to transfer the portal and the code uh, to JPL. So that was done. And we finished up in 2018. So it operated really from five to six years, but in fact, we were able to uh, um, put together a much longer time series because the data are archived in a professional way, very organized, you're able to get ancillary data and, um, and that's what we did. All right. So after that point, uh, and again, this is with colleagues, and I'm going to try to show their pictures where I can. Uh, we started looking at other things you could do with GNSSIR. This happens to be Jeff Freimuller's um, site. Why would you want to use GNSSIR to measure tides? Well, it's relatively cheap. And in that sense, it might even be free. In this case, Jeff Freimuller was measuring tectonics with it. Uh, it doesn't have to be directly on water. Um, I mean, this one seems to be, but it doesn't have to be. And this is the key. It's measuring the vertical position of the sensor. And that means it's an ITRF tide gauge. So if you're not a geodesist, ITRF won't mean anything to you, but for the people on the call that are, that is important. Um, scientific studies need tide gauges in ITRF, and that's just the way it is. So that could be helpful. So let's go back to my sort of um, favorite SNR time series, which is for a two meter tall antenna. Uh, if you do a periodogram of this data set and this data set and use GNSS Reflect, which you're all using now, you will get the same frequency for both of these because it was collected in Boulder, Colorado, Marshall Field, which is relatively flat. I mean, it might be different by a couple centimeters. So these frequencies are the same. But this is the data from Jeff Freimuller's site. Uh, it's a rising and setting arc. Here I've done the direct signal in red, so that's a little bit different. But at low tide, you see these very high frequency signals. And at high tide, you see more typically uh, what you saw in, in um, Boulder. So visually, you can believe me that this is able to see the water changes. And we um, did this a long time ago. There weren't that many satellites. Uh, this would be filled in quite a bit now. We're doing a comparison here, but we spent a lot of time in the paper making it very clear that this tide gauge, which is operated by NOAA, is not co-located. It's 30 kilometers away. And that can make a big difference uh, when you do comparisons, but it was the closest one we had. And um, 
very good correspondence between the real tide gauge and the GPS tide gauge. Um, a few years later, uh, Simon Williams and Richard Ray and I put together a comparison at Friday Harbor. And uh, Richard was interested in long-term comparisons, not just the tidal coefficients in the time series. He wanted to know whether daily averages would give him the same answers and monthly averages would give him the same answers as the tide gauge. Here, the tide gauge is co-located um, with the GPS sensor. It's only about 400 meters apart. Um, and we got very good correlation, better than two centimeters. The monthly comparison's even better than that. But I like this picture from Google Earth because it shows you one of the problems with using uh, uh, GPS tight gauges, just that boats can come into your reflection zone. Um, this isn't the main problem. The main problem would be if you were near a dock and a ship just sat in front of your GPS receiver. Um, but it's something to remember or keep in mind. Uh, I also just wanted to uh, share this with you from the South African geodetic network. Um, again, if you first look at this and you're thinking I can use this to measure soil moisture, it's surrounded by rocks, it's on a hill, it's completely unacceptable for soil moisture. Uh, but I saw this water in the distance and uh, when I used the tool we have for looking at reflection zones, officially, according, theoretically, we should be able to see that water uh, and in fact, we can. So again, the reason we can see that water is that this is 25 meters above that surface. Okay. Uh, then um, John Moore, the late John Moore at the University of Colorado, he had the idea that we could use these uh, sensors in uh, Greenland. I told him that there were some sites that had been, up, excuse me, installed by Iris. Uh, this happens to be one of the Iris crew. This is, the Jeep, this is the antenna at the top and it's been connected to a pole that's below this wooden um, structure here. Now, just keep your eye on that structure that it's actually um, flush with the snow surface when they installed it. This GPS sensor was installed to measure position, not snow depth, but it turns out you can use it to measure snow accumulation. So I'm assuming some of you are here to learn about that. Again, the pluses are it has a relatively large footprint compared to other ways of measuring snow accumulation on um, ice sheets. Um, you can use the vertical positions to correct for snow compaction, fern density issues. Uh, it's uh, you know relatively cheap. I'm not going to say it's super cheap, uh, but you could use a, a cheaper GPS receiver if you wanted. Uh, in this particular case, existing data sets can be analyzed because the GLSEN project that installed it publicly archived the data. And this is a, something for the radar people. This is not gonna be significantly affected by surface wetness. So it doesn't have the same problems uh, that certain radars have. So remember how I said the GPS antenna was flush with the antenna and I pointed that out? This is the next year. And you can see how that um, wooden uh, platform that they built for the antenna is sitting way off the ice surface. And that's the melt you guys measured for your homework. Uh, it was a very large melt uh, episode. And the Iris crew was very nice about sending me the pictures they took every year. And then I just sort of correlated them by eye because a lot of times people didn't believe me when I would show them the picture of the snow accumulation over the years. Uh, but this is what the record looked like from 2001 through the end of 2018. This was a paper we <clears throat> published, um, I guess, just last year. This right here is what you did for your homework, uh, where you saw the melt in 2012. You basically see melt almost every summer. Uh, last summer, sorry, in 2018, that was not the case. Uh, here you see a melt, and you know what that was? That's snow in July, so it did snow in July. So it can snow in the summer in Greenland, answers that question. Uh, you should ask yourself if it's accurate. Uh, Michael McFerrin put together this comparison. Also the late Connie Steffen gave us data from his site. Uh, these are both pingers. So basically they're just measuring um, this distance over a very small footprint. And yes, basically it's accurate. They're both looking and seeing the same trends. So that's very reassuring. And you can read more about that and actually pick up these time series. Um, uh, here it's in an open access paper. 
I also uh, hear just a few more slides. Um, I think I have just a few more slides. I wanted to call out some colleagues, um, uh, Lin Liu, uh, and I worked a little bit on that. Well, he did all, well, he did almost all the work uh, for a site in Barrow, Alaska, where we were looking at the uh, top layer permafrost melt. So the active layer melt in the summer. And um, that wasn't our original intent, but he's the expert and saw uh, what could be done with this method. He took the daily positions from GPSIR. At that point, it was just a GPS receiver. He had uh, hand measurements that they used to make. And, and again, that's a very laborious thing to do. So they would only have a single measurement. Here you can see these red crosses and was able to show, except for the occasional outlier, <clears throat> that there's a very good correspondence between these two. This happens to be in Barrow, Alaska. So another application, permafrost melt. Um, storm surges, my colleagues here in Singapore were interested in looking at this. And again, <clears throat> this is just for a single um, typhoon. Uh, it's in their paper. I can't remember what journal this came out in. Um, maybe GPS Solutions. I apologize, can't remember. Um, again, a new application, maybe not just doing tidal coefficients like we showed for Friday Harbor. You can see storm surges. Um, and then um, during the pandemic, I sort of thought it would be fun to try and measure this tsunami in Alaska. Um, what's shown here are quite a few plots, but basically we have a, a size, sorry, a tsunami model are the colors. So this is the amplitude of the tsunami model. Uh, this is the star is the location of the GPS site. This is the GPS site, it's just so beautiful. It's one of the PBO sites. Uh, it is operating at one sample per second. It's about <clears throat> 70 meters above sea level. I hadn't previously shown you any uh, examples at such a high uh, elevation, but it turns out you can measure sea level accurately from 70 meters above the water surface. Now, during that earthquake, we have Jeff Blewett's measurements of how much it moved vertically. This is about 35 centimeters. So, Again, we have GPS being used for this co-seismic um, offset. This is my measurement of the water surface over a 30-day period. So I measured the tides for 30 days, five days after, and 25 days before the earthquake, just so you could see the tides. Again, that's what tides look like. And then what's shown up here are the comparison between the tsunami model, which is the gray, and then the, the uh, blue and the green dots are the GPS. So it's, a, from my view, it's a relatively small tsunami. Um, you know, of course we could see a much larger tsunami, but there's a good correspondence between the two. And I've segregated the rising and setting arcs just because there are systematic errors that we were uh, looking at to evaluate these data. So uh, this paper is open access. So please feel free to download it if you're interested. And then I wanna call out my uh, colleague here in Germany who had a brand new um, idea, which was to look at sediment compaction. And again, this is a combination of using reflectometry to measure this, but also to look at how the position of the antenna could be changing uh, due to how it was anchored to the earth. So subsidence, if you will. So I think this is, um, uh, a real call out to the nice ideas that the community has for uh, innovative things to do with GNSSIR. So, so to summary, summarize, okay, I, I kind of feel kind of silly saying that, but occasionally people ask me if GNSSIR works and it drives me nuts. Uh, yes, it works. I don't think we need to publish. Um, so I tried to show you accuracy assessments just so you know, People have looked at this. That doesn't mean we couldn't do a better job, but um, at least start from that, okay? Um, yes, we can improve it. And I really would appreciate uh, your input on that because um, a lot of this work was done in the GPS era. We're in the GNSS era now. And, and I, I think that's a place to really improve things. And to do that, um, we'll probably need some more you know, validation efforts, but we also need better models. So let's not 
go all for one versus the other. Um, I showed you PBOH2O because I'm gonna talk about it a little bit when I talk about software. It shows you where we came from, but it also shows you it can be done on a broad scale. All right, I knew nothing about running a network when I started. And with the help of my colleagues, we were able to put that together pretty quickly. So once you have identified ways to evaluate the quality of the products, it's not a huge stretch to be able to apply it on a broad scale. We did it daily. We did it every morning. But you could certainly do it every hour. You could do it every 15 minutes, things like that, if you had the telemetry. Oh, I, it's like it's almost like I know what's in my slides. <laughs> so I don't. I think that might be it. Okay. No, it doesn't work everywhere. I'm not even sure if there's a next slide. Um, how can we make this technique available to more people? Well, that's why I've asked to do this short course, and I'm very glad you came. So the focus of this class. I want you to know why it works. I mean, um, it, it's frustrating when it doesn't work. I totally understand that. I've looked at data from hundreds and hundreds of sites and I'm really happy when it works still, but I've also failed. And for me, I don't feel like a failure. I feel like I wanna know why it failed. That's the more important, I think, lesson so that you can optimize your time on places where it works. I really would like you to be able to tell what makes a good site and what makes a bad site. And that hopefully would mean you could install a good site. Uh, you know, yes, it's really nice to use existing sites, but sometimes if you really want something, you might have to install your own. So uh, what's the precision and accuracy of the method? Again, we tried to write papers for this. Uh, I will be honest, we were so focused on accuracy, we didn't spend as much time talking about precision. The precision you can kind of see by looking at the plots. And we were really focused on the accuracy because we wanted uh, environmental scientists to be able to use it. But you need to talk about precision too. So that will depend, for example, if you want real time or non real time and things like that. And then this is also an introduction to this new software. Uh, GNSS Reflect, which I, you can't pronounce, so I apologize for that. <laughs> That's my fault. Um, and then two targets for today, learn how to measure snow accumulation and learn how to measure water levels. Now, I showed you a ton of applications. This software does not yet support all of those. We don't have models for permafrost melt. I mean, we measure the height changes, but to turn that into permafrost melt is another stage. Um, we're, we, don't, we don't have vegetation in the code. We don't have soil moisture in the code. Uh, we don't have real time in the code, things like that. So the point of this uh, presentation was just to give you an idea of what we could do. And now we're gonna talk about what you can do now, which is snow and water. And those are my extra slides. So um, I'm gonna stop there. My clock says 43 minutes after the hour. So I guess I could take some questions, um, but only for a few minutes. And then I'm gonna go get something to drink to help my throat, uh, maybe some coffee. And then we'll start at the top of the hour. Does that sound good? So do you guys wanna throw me any questions? Because if not, we can stop <laughs> and take a break. Neil Wynn raised hand. Someone's gonna have to tell me, well, do I click on the chat or is someone gonna tell me the question? Uh, this is Neil, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, um, tons of questions, but I'm, I'm gonna try to get one that's relevant to what you were talking about. So when you were mentioning all of these, uh, being, like the tide gauges being ITRF tide gauges and, 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 and towards the end there. Does that mean that when we are processing reflectometry in any of our sites that those locations are relative to ITRF uh, currently 2014 to that particular date and time, much like a PPP solution might be if you're a, G a GNSS real-time person? Um, okay. So if we calculate one Well, I can today, answer your question is no. The answer is no, okay. no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Let's stop it. Um, so <laughs> what you would need to do is download the time series from, you could get it from NGS, maybe you do your own positioning. I usually get my time series, position time series from Jeff Blewett. You need to tag it into, to, so to make it, to, to make it into an ITRF tag gauge, time series computed by somebody you trust, which are in ITRF, you add what you measure in this class, and then we have phase center offsets. So those three things. Got so it, the relative measure. I do have a download. I do, do you guys remember what I call it? Is it download UNR or something like that? I do have a, I do have something that downloads time series for you, which are in ITRF. I do not know what Jeff Blewett is using these days. He's my a colleague that computes positions for all public GNSS sites, GPS sites. It's probably 2014. You've learned how to do reflectometry. The next stage here is making sure we agree on the correct phase center offset to apply. That is one of the things I really would like help on. I have deliberately not added that middle step because I don't want people to start collating result files, some with an antenna in it and some without. That would be a disaster. So one of the things that's being done, we're, I didn't say uh, this is a funded project from NASA, GNSS science team. One is to make this open access or open source, whatever you want to call it. The other thing we said we're doing is to make a real format for the data, which has a header, which would tell us the antenna type, and also to do what you're talking about. Because once you have the antenna type, we could do what you're talking about. But we don't have that right now. So when I say it is an ITRF tag gauge, there's someone in Great Britain right now who does that every day for hundreds of sites. So it can be done. He does it for hundreds of sites. But I don't have it in GNSS Reflect right now. I'd like to add it. But I've, I've kind of been waiting to get the uh, antenna uh, situation in hand. And it's hard because there's so many of them. <laughs> sure, that makes sense. Cool, thank you. Sure. Maybe um, one more question and then I'll take a 10 minute break. Christine, there is one in the, a couple in the chat. Um, okay, I'm opening. So here it goes. The references, feel free to unmute yourself. To be Andrea Gaddy is the first one. Seconds to one second. Do you expect an improvement to the accuracy? You don't have to go 30 to one. You could go 30 to 15. You could go 30 to five. Yes. But it depends on how tall your antenna is. There's no reason to use one second data for a two meter tall antenna. In my opinion, you're just wasting your time. But sure, if you have a taller site, uh, get something either at a higher rate or something in between those sites. How much does the antenna influence the technique? Um, <clears throat> Well, yeah, in some ways, you, I, as a joke, I would tell geodesists buy the worst antenna you could, but they all get upset. The reality is none of those geodetic antennas suppress reflections below about 20 degree elevation angle. And those of you who've done your homework know that's what we're using. I mean, sometimes we go up to 25, but we're really using the data below 20 degrees, right? So none of those expensive geodetic antennas suppress reflections from natural surfaces below 20 degrees. When I say natural surfaces, it's because the best surface, I'm sorry, those geodetic antennas do an outstanding job of suppressing reflections from large metal surfaces. Okay, so, <laughs> so that's why I say natural surfaces. That's why we're able to get away with this is because natural surfaces have different dielectric constants than metal. Those antennas do a really good job of suppressing reflections where the dielectric constant is such that the right-handed energy is changed to left-handed energy and the antenna suppresses left-handed energy. So personally, I wouldn't spend a lot of money on my antenna, but if I wanna share my site with geodesists, and they want an expensive antenna, I let them have it. 
The nice thing about the expensive antennas, all of them, is they have a very symmetric phase centering pattern, and that's useful. I mean, I, I'm not a, I'm not against geodesists having expensive uh, antennas. What are your thoughts on airborne? I don't do it. That's my thought. So uh, I think uh, I would suggest you go right to drones. I, I don't think the future is going to be in airborne surveys. Um, I was asked a lot about drones uh, when I was in this business, and we just never got into it. We had too much to do. Uh, but I encourage you to do that. I think it'd be a really, uh, I think now that they're letting up and letting people actually fly drones in the US for a long time, it was really restricted. But I think that that would be an interesting thing to do. You'd get a bigger footprint. And I think that could be more valuable. So what we're doing is getting a very local measurement, which is good for, you know, validation purposes and so on. And we can share data, but if you want to get something that might be valuable on a broader scale, I would recommend drones can have the capability. That's uh, thank you very much. I tear up 2014. So I think I'm going to stop now. These are all good questions, but I just got to go get something to drink upstairs, get some coffee. And then, um, you know what I might do, guys, is I might go right from software to snow. And then maybe we'll take a break between snow and water. Did, it, did that make sense? Anyway, so let's stop and, and start in about 10 minutes. Okay, so I guess I should uh, share a screen again. Is that right? Can people hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so Christine goes to share screen. Software tools, let's give it a go. Okay. <laughs> Let me know if my slides stop working again. <laughs> All right, um, so this is supposed to be a little bit shorter. Uh, I wanted, I was hoping that people that wanted to know about um, how the method works and more background on the periodograms and the footprints and this and that would watch the videos. Um, Melissa's gonna have a survey on your thoughts on this short course. So I really would appreciate some feedback on those videos. It's something I've never done before, um, but hopefully some of that information got through so we wouldn't have to spend that time on it today. Um, why? Okay, so I guess uh, my outline of this part is I want to talk to you about uh, the codes that are available to you or the software tools that are available to you. Some of this relates to PBOH20, which was one of the reasons I brought it up. I am not going to talk about Felipe's uh, simulator, but he worked really hard on it. I think he did a great job. Uh, he made it publicly available. It's in MATLAB. And he wrote a paper about it. So I would just point you to that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the original MATLAB tools I published in 2018. But today, the main things are the GNSS reflectance code that was um, developed by myself, Tim, Kelly, and so on. So this is sort of the outline of things I'm going to talk about in the next 30 minutes or so. Um, so let's just start with PBOH20, because that's where this all really came from. Um, <clears throat> it was in Fortran. And um, all the code was in Fortran and uh, that did the dirty work behind the scenes. But I was the only person who coded in Fortran. And that's a problem when you try to keep something running. Uh, now, there were some MATLAB wrappers. Uh, my students all spoke MATLAB. And uh, so the, you know, the snow depth, the Swede, the vegetation metrics, the um, <clears throat> soil moisture models were in MATLAB. And we still have them. Um, we downloaded 1,300 files a day. Uh, and that was primarily done with shell scripts. It was a GPS only world back then. So we mostly just got broadcast orbit and so on. But we used shell scripts. We used things that I knew how to use, which meant shell scripts, Fortran. I knew MATLAB. Uh, I did not know about all these uh, environmental databases, but Mostly we access them by shell scripts, but you know, 
if you want to go down this rabbit hole, it's complicated. Uh, every time you have to access one of these centers, you're going to have to deal with their security problems and issues and things. It's just a full-time job keeping everything running. So it ran every day for five years. Um, and we gave it to JPL, it ran. We gave the right answer when we gave it to them and I wish them the best with it, but it's not something we operate anymore. Um, we gave them a functioning set of codes. Um, back then, most of the environmental data types were based on L2C data, in fact, all of them. And uh, just to give you an idea how things have changed, there were three satellites when I started, and there are now 24. So in the olden days, you know, I had very few observations. Now you can do almost anything with L2C. Okay, so that's PBOH2O. It was Fortran. I gave it to JPL to run or not. And uh, I thought as I was retiring, it would be a good thing to give some software to the cryosphere community. And that's where this came from. It wasn't really meant to do anything else. It was, an op it was my effort to make some of my code more easily used by the cryosphere community. Because I was using Fortran, right? We had 1, 1,300 sites to look at, and we did not use MATLAB scripts for that. So what I put on the uh, GPS the toolbox were, were the translators, which were in Fortran. Um, and I, I wrote specific visualization tools to help the cryosphere community because I didn't think they would have the background in looking at the data and to help them. And it would give them a, a, an interface so that they could do a snow accumulation, especially for the ice sheet people. And we had these reflection zone codes. And so I thought, well, let's give them to people. So we uh, had those in MATLAB and um, we also, wanted to help people pick a sampling rate. Some people were asking in the break, why one seconds, 30 seconds, whatever. So we, we coded that up as well. And that's in MATLAB. The current version of that code is on GitHub, um, but it's no longer supported. And I had added um, some data fetching inside the MATLAB, but it's just, it's a, it's a big job to keep up with the security protocols at these archives and they've also started to change their directory structures and so on. So I just can't keep that up, but I am letting you know it's there. And that was sort of a, I thought that was it. I wasn't really planning to develop any more code um, at that point. So the code you're here to learn about really just came out of a hobby project of mine. Uh, about two years ago, I decided I'd like to make a web app or learn how to make a web app, or, you know, I was watching videos. It was a lot of fun. It was all new. And, um, you know, I just didn't want to. So, anyway, you know, all the, all the videos on YouTube are people's signing up to read blogs and stuff, and I didn't want to make a blog. I was curious if I could do something real. So I like, I know about GPS. I was curious if I could make a web app that G, did GPS IR fast enough that it would be useful. And it was kind of an advertisement, but it wasn't meant to be, I guess I didn't really mean for it to stick around, but it, it's been there a couple of years now. Uh, this is its current state. Um, it has examples. Uh, originally it just read from archives, one archive in fact, or there were lots of restrictions in the beginning, but most of you will recognize, sorry, these, uh, Things here, minimum and maximum reflector heights, elevation angle restrictions, peak to noise. Um, it now uh, allows, sorry, it now allows you to pick your azimuths. Uh, the output files are in text or CSV. Um, and then, you know, it's a separate thing to actually upload a Rhinox file, but that was new. So I learned how to do that. So I let people who follow my rules upload the Rhinox files. And one of the complications of this is, despite the fact that I got it to be pretty fast, uh, it was too slow. If you click the submit button, um, I was told it was too slow because it took more than a few seconds for the results to pop up, five to 10 seconds in time. <clears throat> so it uses what's called a task queue. It goes off and does 
the task and when the results are available, you can use JavaScript to query that. Um, it's all in Python. It uses Flask if you know what that is. Uh, by GPS API standards, it's fast. When I want to get a position from the Canadian PPP service, it's five to 10 minutes. You know, and they email me the results. There's no immediate response. There's no task queue that I can see. So, you know, it's fast. But to make it fast, and just because of what I was doing back then, it's GPS only. Uh, it has reflector height restrictions because of speed. If you want to do a one second file, it will not be fast enough. And in fact, it might time out of my uh, web app server. So I mean, I'm not saying it couldn't be done, but this was a hobby. I have a hobby license on this uh, web server. So that's why it is the way it is. Can I add GNSS? Sure, but I haven't yet. So file uploads are allowed, but they can't be huge. Uh, I wrote it front to back. And to do that, I had to learn Python, which I didn't know, which is how we got here. Uh, I posted a short video. It's very similar to GNSS Reflect. In fact, that's how I learned to write the code that you're using, is by making this web app. <coughs> um, you can run it from the command line if you want. If you don't want to install GNSS Reflect, you can use this API. Just use curl. Now, it takes five to 10 seconds. And what drives me nuts is half the time is getting orbits which is just sad, but that's the way it is because I'm not gonna store 10 years of orbits on Heroku. I don't even think I'm allowed to on a hobby, uh, you know, um, as a, uh, what's the right word? Whatever, my account is as a hobbyist, you know, whatever, it costs $15 a month. Um, if it were supported by an organization that already had the orbits, this would be a two second, app and you could get the results right away. Just saying, in case anybody wants to um, support it. Um, so basically, you decide L1, L2, so on and so forth, the, the minimum and maximums, as I told you. Again, I added the azimuths recently. Uh, this will look familiar to you too. Uh, it's, again, this is a, I think I pushed the sample Button. This is uh, Summit Camp Greenland. So it, it is 15 meters above the snow surface. So this here says, well, in fact, it says 14 meters. Uh, these periodograms are telling you the frequency content of each of this rising and settling GPS satellites. Uh, there's a summary here that shows you what the reflection heights are across these azimuths. And you can see there's this kind of this slopey thing. Blue is good, gray is fail. And you're getting some metrics that if you've done the homework are telling you some things. Some people have asked me, why are there so many failures here? Well, what's over there? There's like a town, it's the summit camp town. <laughs> anyway, uh, you want the results, they're right there. And click on the text file. Um, so if this looks familiar to you, it's, there's a reason for that. Uh, this is if you apply azimuth constraints. I was told that there's a quiet zone up at summer camp, and if you want to do in situ measurements, you should restrict to those azimuths. And you can see, in fact, that those periodograms, they look pretty sweet. They're right on top of each other. And in fact, very consistent reflectors, reflections there of about, well, 14.25 meters, okay? So this is one of the use cases if you want to look at it and do it in GNSS Reflect. Uh, the other thing, because I knew how to do a web app, uh, when I thought about porting that MATLAB code so that you could look at reflection zones, I just decided against it. The idea of making those uh, KML files and you have to open up Google Earth and blah, 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 just got tired of it. And I figured, well, I know how to do a web app and it's actually non-trivial to include the Google Maps, but at least they do provide some help to you. So I was able to figure it out. Basically, uh, I got tired of entering latitude, longitudes, and heights. So I did download JetFluent's database. So if you're using an existing site, you can try just putting those that character in there. Um, if you're by sea level, you can click this button. 
if you're not by sea level and you, you're going to use your own reflector height value, you have to click this button and put in the value. And I've got some different ranges. I can put in a begin, I mean, I can give you more control over that, but this was a first start. These are the common values people use and azimuth angles. So that's where that came from. I don't, I don't plan, and there's a video on this, I don't plan to make it part of the pipeline code. I'm, I think it fits in well for the GNSS Reflect because then I don't have to have Python dealing with Google. Um, so just to summarize, because this section is about software, and this is, these are the main issues for all reflectometry softwares, at least ground-based. You have to be able to translate the files. Uh, we're currently just doing Rhinox, but we're going to add NMEA. Uh, but you have to be able to translate files. And what we need in those files that isn't in them are azimuth and elevation angles. And they do not have to be super accurate. Broadcast level is fine, but you got to be able to do it. Secondly, you always need to pick your azimuth and elevation angle mass. Now, can you automate that? Sure. And in fact, I'm encouraging you to pick one for your site, and that's it for the whole time. But <clears throat> certainly when we were analyzing hundreds of sites, we had used automated software to pick the azimuths and the elevation angles. All right, we had done that. But we were doing soil moisture and snow. Some of you are interested in sea level, and sea level is intrinsically more interesting in terms of its mask, because it's the very rare site that's surrounded all azimuths with water. So you almost always have a, a more prescri prescribed azimuth mask and quality control metrics. But that's right now, I let you control that and I have some uh, help for you, but you have to make good choices. So uh, Tim put together this uh, nice cartoon that just shows you the Rhinex and the orbits go into Rhinex to SNR. The orbits, uh, we've tried our best to make this have defaults where you don't have to think more than your station, your year, and the day of year. But the default for orbits are GPS only. <coughs> if you want to use multi GNSS, you have to say so. Um, <clears throat> again, Rhinex, the default is Rhinex version two. If you want to use Rhinex version three, it's allowed, but you have to say so. Um, and then we've made this quick look um, capability. It originally only returned periodograms, uh, but now we do have this summary. And the goal is to give you feedback about what your azimuths should be, what your quality control parameters should be. That's in addition to using the reflection zone app. Uh, because th that reflection zones are going to tell you uh, where the water is for example, or where the building is. Uh, you can very easily get a good strong reflection from a road, but you wouldn't want to measure soil moisture in it or snow, for example. Uh, the actual, uh, once you've got this figured out, you think you understand the site, there is this extra stage. I called it make JSON input. Maybe that wasn't a very good name. Uh, just to let you know, it only has the four required parameters. It requires latitude, longitude, and height really just for the refraction correction. And you, you can turn that off, but it's su highly suggested. And um, everything after that, you can change some of it on the command line, uh, but there are defaults that are meant to work for most people. And when I say most people, really it's for the people that have big, nice open fields. If you're gonna do sea level, <clears throat> you're gonna to have to change the azimuths by hand because I don't have that on the command line yet. Um, but also I recognize that people are gonna to wanna to say, well, analyze the whole year. So it does have some ability to both translate and run the code for multiple days. Uh, the environmental products, are, uh, so Neil was kind of asking about this, sea level is an environmental product. I mean, we have some tools to help you do that. They're not all finished, but some of them are. And uh, so that is something that we can continue working on, but we do produce the reflector heights, which are used 
for these particular environmental products, snow accumulation and, and sea level. So we used to have lots of inputs and we tried to strip them out. Year, day of year, station name. If you don't know those three things, that's probably a deal breaker. Um, even the original MATLAB code, which again came from this older PBOH Joe system, you required to use Fortran. Um, and that was because it was fast and I had it. <clears throat> but we decided in this code that we would remove it. Okay. So you still could, if you had existing files that you'd already translated, you can still use them. Um, but you no longer are forced to. Uh, use those Fortran codes. But we had to strike a balance because, you know, measuring sea level and measuring snow depth, snow accumulation on the ice sheet are pretty different things. And the snow accum accumulation people are pretty happy with a daily average and the tide people are not. And there are some different uh, model issues. Like Neil was asking about ITRF. I've yet to meet a cryosphere person that really cares about ITRF for snow accumulation. So there are different issues and we have one code and we wanna make it friendly to both. So that, that's the balancing act. Um, we have added more feedback. The code is now really entirely in Python, <clears throat> but um, Kelly gave me some feedback about how slow the Python calculations were um, for the orbit calculations. And so I taught myself how to use Fortran within Python, and, and now Tim also knows how to do that. So we're using NumPy, if you know what that is. And, but that is the reason you needed G-Fortran to exist, but basically so you don't have to know Fortran, and you don't have to compile the code yourself. And the issue is not the file reader. I know how to, I can, I know you can read a file uh, quickly in Python, but doing the orbits is not as fast. So that's why that is. So uh, there are videos on how to run the code. <clears throat> I suspect I made mistakes when I made those videos, so I might have to fix them, but they're there. I'm definitely gonna be adding ones on the more difficult uh, applications like tall sites. And then there are the practical sessions following this one. Uh, there are also use cases. Um, we started with those and that was really helpful with uh, our group to make sure that we, well, you know, that's how you find bugs. You know, you run your own code. You're sure to break it. I'm not sure if this is the last slide. Okay. Your main resource is the GitHub README. I think this is actually pretty old, but um, the main, again, the initial task is to translate those Rhinox files. Um, I'll just skip some of this, but yeah, I will skip some of this, but I, I will point out, if you want to use Rhinex version three, you have to have this GFZ Rhinex um, code. And we have a, a tool that helps you install that. But I don't read Rhinex three directly. As far as orbits, I just want to make it clear. We use SP3 formats for orbits because they're there, not because we need precise orbits, OK? Um, for the Rhinex readers, <clears throat> I think we're up to 10 archives. Um, we don't have all the high rate archives coded up, but we have many 30 second archives. Um, but if you would like us to add archives, or if you find a bug, uh, please submit you know, a pull request, or if you're not comfortable with that, you can send me an email and I'll try to include it. But try to make it look like the other code, <coughs> by which I mean, go get the orbit using the year, month, day, or the year, day of year. And that's the way we work. Um, I had some questions. Someone told me there were some Slack questions about your own Rhinex files. You have to set the no look command to be true. It should look at, look for your file right where you're running the code. Um, I did get some people commenting on this and I, because I was preparing these lectures, I didn't have time to uh, look at them closely, but I'll, I'll look at that again. Yes, you can use your own Rhinox files, uh, but 
I would say, you know, it's like anything, you have to follow the rules and the rules have naming conventions. And a lot of people don't use my naming conventions and I understand that, but that's the rule. I won't be able to find your files if you're not following my rules. So, you know, things like that. Okay, and I already told you this, we have this web app now to do the reflection zones. It's currently GPS only. It'd be pretty easy to add other constellations. I haven't done it. If you're interested in having that update, let me know. Uh, I'm gonna make an API for the Nyquist code that was in the MATLAB uh, code, because I think it's a valuable code um, to have to help people pick their sampling rate. But in, I mean, there are some rules of thumb. If you're two meters tall, you know, up to about 10 meters, yes, you can get away with 30 seconds. Double it, you know, do 15 seconds if you're up to 20 meters and so on and so forth. Um, you don't have to use one second. It doesn't have to be a one versus 30 thing. Uh, it can be somewhere in between. So I think that's stopping there. So that, okay, I got through that in time pretty quickly, I think. What I think I'm gonna do just because I think it'll give me more time to you know, put a break between the snow and water, I'm gonna take a few questions here if there are any, and then I'm gonna go into snow. So I apologize for that. Feel free to just go take a break yourself, but maybe during this question section if you want. But if anybody has any questions, could they ask them either on Slack or on Zoom? I guess I open up my chat. Uh, yes, it does include that. So the person who previous, so someone had asked me, is there an error bar on the daily averages? Yes, there is. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's there. Any other questions? So I'm gonna open up snow. So can you guys see that snow thing? Do you see, do you see something that says practical session on snow? No, I'm still seeing the choosing the AZL mask. So I'm gonna say stop share, and then I'm gonna say share screen, and then I'm gonna pick the snow. Now do you see something that says practice session on snow? Yes. Okay. And there is one question in the chat. Okay. Um, you know, it kind of went away when I played with things. So could someone read it to me? Have you thought of using GFZRNX for merging Rhinex files instead of TechC? Yeah, I've thought about it and we should do it, <laughs> but I haven't. You're right. Uh, I also, uh, well, it's not just the Rhinex 3 reading. Um, Rhinex 3 is by far the best way to get the best signals because people put everything in it. So some of you know now that there's L2P and L2C, and I like L2C. Uh, GFZ Rhinex is used to extract those L2C signals because sometimes people don't put them in the uh, Rhinex 2. Um, it has a lot of other capabilities that I'm not currently taking advantage of, and I will probably do that because TQC is not supported um, officially. It's still useful, but it's not officially supported. Um, so I think that's a good question, and I think we'll do that because it's one less thing you have to install, which is good. Anybody else? Okay, so it's 1030. Um, the snow thing is set up. I'm supposed to talk for 10 minutes about snow, but since I'm doing snow accumulation and ice sheets, you know, they're kind of different. And, um, and then I'm supposed to give you a practical part. And then Kelly's going to do Jupyter Notebooks. I, again, the practical part. And then we'll take a break and then we'll do water. But anyway, I'm covering a lot of stuff and I have way too many slides. So I'm just gonna go right through them, I think, and get started. And I'm not supposed to take more than 25 minutes because it's 10 minutes intro, 15 minutes practical, then it's 15 minutes Kelly, and then questions, and then a break, okay? So let's go.
I think. Uh, so you're still seeing this lovely photo? Yep. OK, there you go. And then Kelly and I talked about it, and we decided we would try to answer your homework. <laughs> so if you are curious what the answers were. So anyway, so uh, I don't know that I put this in any videos, but I used to show this plot or figure in every presentation. But basically, just a quick and dirty you know, reflections for bare soil, snow. We're looking at the difference between the reflection off the top of the snow layer versus like if you're in the Rocky Mountains in the summer on bare soil. So it's the bare soil reflection versus the snow reflection. The person who asked in the chat, can I see both wet snow and dry snow? Yes, the top. I don't see into this, right? I don't see into this. Vegetation we're not covering in this class. Soil moisture produces a tiny uh, change that we luckily are able to see, but it's very, very small, which I'm trying to represent here. So I added to my cartoon, you know, snow layers. So like snow accumulation, it's all snow, right? But it's of various densities. I'm not seeing through the snow, I'm just the top. Okay, so that's what I'm trying to represent here. So again, the person who uh, asked the question, we're not like radar. What's the look angle of a radar for those green Greenland returns? It's a much higher elevation angle. So uh, in that sense, we're different, good and bad, right? So again, on an ice sheet, this nice person from Iris, he was a really very, very good colleague. Um, we're measuring the distance from this phase center to there over a large area, right? Not just there, but you know, maybe 20, 30 meter radius around that um, <clears throat> antenna. Okay, so what that tells you about snow accumulation is complicated depending on how this antenna is connected to the earth, right? Because I, I can only tell you where this is going. If the bottom is going somewhere too, that's really up to you to figure out. Um, and I'll show you some examples. So John Moore made this plot and don't get scared by the, the uh, he made a really exaggerated slope, but go to his paper. John was just the best writer and he was just trying to point out that, you know, depending on how this antenna is anchored into the snow layer, it wasn't very deep, it's gonna be, I call it sinking. Other people, you know, may not call it sinking, but that antenna is moving down into the fern, the snow layer, whatever you want to call it. And that's going to affect age. It's, you're not just going to see snow accumulation, depending on how that thing is anchored. And here I am not going to attempt to explain it all to you. I will just point you to John's original, everything in that paper that he wrote. He's just a beautiful writer, and I encourage you to read it. If you're on an ice sheet, depending on how that is anchored, you might also be sensitive to that fern. Um, I'm gonna give you an example, because I always, you know, seeing is believing, right? When I saw the correlation between the vegetation and the noise metrics, it was seeing it, that correlation that taught me something. So in this case, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> Iris installed most of them with just a very short anchor, maybe a meter into the snow. I can't remember the exact number. But at one of them, which is called Neem Camp, GLS3, they had a borehole there. There had been a previous drilling experiment, and they had this thing that was 90 meters deep. OK, that's 90 meters deep anchored. It's very different than a one meter stick it in the snow, right? So they put the GPS antenna right here on top of that, onto that uh, borehole, right? But the next year they moved it to a normal, quote, normal iris mount, and that's fine. They wanted them all to be the same. And that, that made sense. You know, people, you know, these, this field work is difficult. They have to make decisions like this depending on how much time they have. But when you looked at the data, it just about blew up in your face. The first year, so this is reflector height. Remember, so you're used to seeing reflector height. You, you're used to me always doing it backwards, right? 
So it's 2.8 here, okay? The first year, <clears throat> it just sat there at one. Now, John and I spent a lot of time talking about that, but who knows what happened. <clears throat> so when it was anchored to something 90 meters deep, you didn't see any shallow changes. Then they moved it to their normal sensor. I'm sorry, their normal mount. And of course, okay, it's 2.8 meters on the day they moved it. And that sucker is sinking like crazy. All right, so in fact, every two to three years, they have to change it. In fact, it can't be used anymore because no one's taking care of it. Uh, since the pandemic. So it's if it's not buried, it's simply not usable because it's, the antenna is too close to the snow surface. And so when John talks about sensitivity to fern, that's what he's talking about. And you can see it in the vertical positions. Now these are from Jeff Blewett's site. Uh, I haven't done anything other than download it. Uh, this is when it was on that borehole. And that's that little thing I told you John and I worried about. Um, that's a much higher sinking, sinking rate than there. Okay. So the good news is John, not John, sorry, Jeff Blewett and other services provide these positions. And in this paper that I told you is open source, not open source, whatever, open option. You can download these positions. These are from the Blewett Nevada Reno website. Here's my work. You can remove that and you're left with snow accumulation. All right. So, or if you're interested in the fern density problem, you can look at those positions and use them. So, I mean, I, I think that for the experts, I don't presume to talk about cryosphere processes because it gets me into trouble. But there's data there that you can figure out what's going on by thinking about how deep the antenna was when it was, you know, and they're all very shallow except for that one time. So I think it's a really uh, interesting application. In some places, it's not a big effect, this compaction issue. So for homework two, we had you look at the granddaddy of these sites, GLS1. We asked you to first translate it. That's all the defaults. It was only GPS to begin with. So we didn't tell you to try to use GNSS because there is no G GNSS. Um, <clears throat> run quick look, we asked you to look at that. And this is what you got for the periodogram. Looks a little messy, but notice here, this elevation angle, there's a reason that's there. It's because it's to remind you, it says the lowest elevation angle it got was 6.85 degrees. And that's because Iris put a, elevation angle mask on the receiver. And they shouldn't have done that, but they were really nice about removing it when I asked them to. Uh, so I, I don't remember, maybe 2015 on, it doesn't have it, but I don't like to mix and match. So I always use seven at this site. Why does it go to 6.85? I don't know, Trimble does something like that. But this is the retrieval metrics. Uh, basically this is reflector height for all azimuths. And I think in the videos, I talk about why it doesn't work up here. And it's not because there are obstructions there. It's because of the way we've parameterized the models and because the uh, satellites don't rise very high there. So it's, it's triggering some quality control issues, but it's not an issue since you have all these beautiful blue dots to use anyway. So just using the defaults, you get a pretty good um, retrieval. And this is for a single day of data. You could, we told you to throw out these data because we wanted you to work on learning how to set your own azimuth mask. But the code's doing a pretty good job of throwing them out anyway. And they're actually, they're not crazy values, right? They're pretty similar. I think I am talking too much. Oh, all right, well, maybe not. Uh, then uh, we said to make some files. Again, this uses the day of year end thing. So you can do the entire year. Uh, we added this thing called weekly, so you could do homework without, without having to do so much data translation. So instead of getting a measurement every day, it would go every week. Um, this is the analysis strategy. This is the latitude, longitude, and height. I think for one of my colleagues who didn't care about refraction, I allowed him to put in zero, zero, zero. 
so that you didn't have to know that. It doesn't have to be very accurate. You can just uh, use a, a, an approximate value, use the same one for all days. I'll probably add in an option to let you use the Blewett values if you want to. Here's the minimum elevation angle I'm adding. And that's really just because there are no data below seven. And I don't want to trigger any quality control that says, oh, you have a lot of missing data, so you shouldn't use it. Uh, I set L1 to true. And these, I don't remember if those were the defaults, but good enough. Uh, here's where we hand edited the uh, azimuths right here. Um, in the videos, I talk about these more. You can see right here, I don't allow that antenna to be taller than six meters. Uh, you analyze the data basically using the same command structure that you used for um, RhinoX SNR, and that's by design so that you could just get used to using the same commands. Um, here's the daily average, which Kelly confirmed for me does have a, uh, does have a standard deviation in it. <clears throat> it creates a plain text or a CSV output. We'll probably add a JSON. No, I'm not sure. Maybe for the API. But anyway, uh, the median filter means that each day it computes a median and then it throws out the gross outliers. I mean, you can use standard deviations, of course, but I don't really like gross outliers to be in there before I do that. So that's why I use a median filter. The minimum number of tracks is site specific depending on how many frequencies you can use, but it's a pretty good sense of what's good. So when I ran this on my computer, I had all the data analyzed. So lots more points. You, if you did the homework and used weekly, you won't have as many points. It tells you the number of values used in the daily average. So you could set those. Um, I think I had one question. So I'm going to allow or ask if anybody wants to say, does anybody know what happened on these days when the number of retrievals went down? Any guesses? Because you know, most of the time it's between 60 and 70. I see a chat. Did someone say they knew? No, but that's a good guess. <coughs> Not solar activity. Okay, all good, 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 good. Uh, so it's not rainfall, it, it's snowfall. So somebody asked if I could see wet and dry snow. Uh, dry compacted snow, that's a nice, yeah, that's a great reflector. But fluffy snow, not so good. So the first day, the first day it snows, you know, the reflections aren't as good. But notice they're not zero, right? I'm not getting zero retrievals, I'm just getting fewer. And you've got that nice fluffy, fluffy layer before it compacts, basically. So that's when it's snowed. Uh, whoever said rain, you are right though, and that'll come up in the soil moisture. So, but right here, this is snow. So the environment changed. Um, that's what changed. Great, perfect. All right, so this is what mine looked like. Uh, yours should only have a point every seven days. And, uh, you know, uh, 2012 is a huge melt year, just huge. Uh, so um, these, I th these data are useful. They, the situ data are useful in Greenland. So you are now able to do that. Um, all right, so snow reflections is a little bit different. And so those of you guys who said snow, water, um, environmental condition changing, those do come in here a little bit. I'm only gonna talk about this broadly because we don't have a ton of time and I'd rather spend our time on questions than on me babbling. But the issue here is unlike Greenland and Antarctica, and Kelly's gonna show an Antarctic site, there's no bare soil issues on ice sheets, right? But here I'm gonna compare, I wanna know snow depth and snow water equivalent. So I kind of have to have a place to start and that place to start is bare soil. Right? I mean, you want it, what was the answer when there was no snow and then you compare to that? I mean, that's effectively what you're doing. But to do that, you really need to know what the dielectric constant is for bare soil and what it is 
for snow and how that might cause a bias. And so we have one model in here, but you know, I'm not saying you couldn't you know, improve it slightly. Second issue would be, is it really bare soil? Because vegetation affects things too, right? So if it snowed when there was a lot of green vegetation, that would be different than if it was on dead vegetation, right? And I used to feel pretty guilty about you know, my vegetation problems until I visited somebody in Alaska and they told me they went and cut the vegetation around from their sensor. So you know, we all do different things. I worry. So these are like, I found these old slides. These are reflector height series. Uh, I, I'm showing it upside down. You know, this is bare soil here is about two meters. This is snow, snow, snow. It melts, slowly melts, and it's back to where it started, right? Essentially what we do is just flip this because combined with the penetration depth of the bare soil and the dielectric change, to first order, it's pretty good to just flip it. Um, we, and these do have error bars, right? These are the standard deviations using, you know, we, we're doing on average. So we have a standard deviation from that average to give us the uncertainty. We added uncertainties also based on the fact that we don't have a perfect, uh, um, you know, the bare soil correction is not perfect. So we made the error bars larger to assess that. The other thing that a lot of people didn't realize about PBO2O was that we absolutely gave up measuring snow depths less than five centimeters. Absolutely. We, if it was below five centimeters, we set it to nothing, but it wasn't because we weren't, it's because we didn't think we could do it accurately. It's very hard to measure two centimeters of snow with this method. If your goal in life is to measure two centimeters of snow, you should get another sensor. Because there are lots of things that affect the signal at that level. Vegetation affects the signal at that level, for example. So anyway, that's kind of what we do. Uh, if you're interested in how we came up with our ideas of how accurate our method is, I really point you to what Jim McRae and Eric Small did. They were in charge of the validation efforts. Uh, we paid people to go out with sticks and shovels to measure snow depth and SWE, uh, dig pits. I don't think this will show up very well because, well, I can sort of see it, but I have a big screen, but there's some red dots there. The black dots are what PBOH2O made. The red dots are a human measuring transects of snow depth and in some cases SWE for all those sites, right? Throughout different points of winter. Um, these were sites that had relatively large amounts of snow. Most of PBO sites didn't, right? Uh, this is just a slide I took from McRae's uh, paper. And the correlation was quite good, 0.97 between GPS <coughs> SWE and in situ SWE, uh, but it wasn't perfect. There was a bias, okay, two centimeters. And if you require millimeter SWE, I, okay, I'd like to see how you're proving that is at all useful uh, for what you're doing. Because when you measure SWE here, can you say it's good for SWE over the entire field? No, you can't. So you have to be careful when you come up with these statistics and, and worry about millimeters when you in fact aren't measuring over a larger area that's more relevant for the people that are gonna use your data. So we were planning to add the SWE code next year. We have the snow depth code already. And then my second example, and then I'll stop. So the first example, uh, again, was GLS-1. Now I'm talking about seasonal snow. I was gonna show you uh, Coldfoot, Alaska. Uh, that's what it looks like. It was one of the PBO sites. It's uh, apparently on the road <clears throat> from Fairbanks to Barrow. I think is what I found out when I visited Fairbanks. Um, I don't know, it looked like it had a nice empty field around it to me. Um, you know, there's the Google Earth image. Sure looked like nice planar surfaces. I don't see big rocks, I don't see trees. I don't have the scale bar here, but it, I mean, this, this is just empty. Um, and you know, we measured snow depth there and SWE over 10 years, right? So we did it. 
But I will say it was one of the more challenging sites we had. <clears throat> I, I never really understood why it was so challenging. Uh, but I'm going to show you what I had to do um, if you want to look at this site. Uh, first of all, PBOH2O only used L2C data. It's now much easier to get that data. But back then, it was hard to get. Um, it was provided in the one hertz files for me starting in 2011. And um, we don't need that one hertz stream. It would just make everything super slow. So I'm going to decimate it. I'm going to download it and decimate it. Now, in PBOH2, we didn't decimate. We didn't know any better. We were using Fortran, so the fact that it took longer didn't really bother us. And it was happening at night, so no one was paying any attention. But now I like things a little faster. So I download the high rate data, but I decimate it. And I, I know it's at UNAVCO. And I'm going to pick a day like October 1st and, and January 30th. So one is going to be bare soil, probably. I also learned in Alaska, you can't assume there's no snow at that point, but we'll go crazy. And uh, we'll try January 30th. Um, this is what you get for bare soil. Uh, gray means the periodic room means you're not getting good retrievals, right? Color is good in my scheme of life. Um, this is uh, L2C. I don't know about you, but I think L2C is better. <laughs> so if you ask me why I use L2C, <clears throat> this is why. So again, let's look at L1, which is more broadly available on more satellites. Uh, in fall, it looked pretty good. And it was these southern azimuths, right? From like 90 to 270 or 100 to 250. Um, winter's okay, but everything's a little bit, the quality's a little lower. Um, these blue dots are a little bit below the line where you look, well, it just means there's some snow on the ground. I didn't pick a particularly high snow depth value. I mean, winter looks okay in the L1 data. But again, L2 is better. What you're seeing here, though, is there aren't as many satellites, right? Uh, there are 31 L1 satellites and there are 24 L2C. Um, even the places I've thrown out the data actually look pretty good, if, you're, if we're being honest. But that has to do with how we parameterize the data. And we could change that. Uh, it, it, it's actually in that JSON, but we're not using it here. Okay, I'm almost done. So my recommendations, I don't have a time series here, but I just thought I'd show you the steps I would use. I would use both L1 and L2C, but only the Southern Quadrants. Um, I tended to be conservative and I suggest you be conservative too. Even though the retrievals look pretty good in the North, I'd be careful. But before you start posting stuff on your website, you should analyze the whole year and look at it and make sure it makes sense. Now it does snow in July and August. So you, I mean, in Alaska, it can snow, but if it slowly snows, that just probably means vegetation is growing, right? So it, it, it's, it's the kind of thing that they don't teach you in school, but you need to be skeptical. I also just remind you, bare soil tends to be a much better reflector than snow. A lot of that has to do with smoothness. Snow is not necessarily as smooth as um, bare soil. And it also depends if people are driving around your site in snow. Okay, so that might be another thing. Uh, and then when is bare soil for Alaska? I mean, we had PBOH tour working really well for the Western US. Then we added Alaska, and that just meant we had to have a different flag because. Bare soil in Alaska is August. Western US, it's September. So in Colorado, I don't have to worry about snow at the PBO sites, a lot of snow, but I had to in Alaska. So just, you gotta take these things into account. And then what happens in summer? So I really wanted to try and measure soil moisture here. It looks to me like nice flat soil. <clears throat> I never could get it to work. And in fact, I had trouble even getting snow depth sometimes. Uh, it was like there was some noise in the data I couldn't identify. And, you know, it's surrounded by RVs and cars. Now, this is summer, but, you know, people drive on that road in the winter too. So, anyway, um, 
my message here is, if you're gonna use other people's sites, sometimes, not always, you have to, to know a little bit about the site. <clears throat> because on the map, I didn't realize this was like, you know, RV heaven. So um, I think that's, I think that's my last site, uh, my last, oh, good, I'm done. So I'm gonna exit that. I'm gonna stop, well, maybe I won't stop sharing in case there are questions. <clears throat> so should we, maybe let's wait. There's a lot of big truck traffic. Yes, I know that now. <laughs> Thank you, Ken Austin. Actually, when I was in Fairbanks for, to amuse my, I, you know, I asked during my seminar how many people did to Coldfoot, and I swear to God, half the audience had been there, maybe two thirds. Really, I knew it's crazy. All right, so I think what we're going to do is we're going to let Kelly go, and then we'll take questions together, and then we will take a fifteen-minute break. Okay, so I'm going to say stop sharing, um, and. Um, Kelly has done the Jupyter Notebook um, port, and she has, I've learned a lot from working with her. Um, I like that we're able to provide both. Um, there are different ways of interacting with the software. And uh, so I will just let Kelly talk. Perfect, thank you. Um, so I am gonna go through a couple of the use cases using the Jupyter Notebook implementation that we've used with Christine's code. So I will just set this up in a second. <clears throat> Great. Um, so the, the first station that we're gonna start with looking at is, is Lorg. It's on the Ross ice shelf in Antarctica. Um, the site is largely featureless ice plain with no obstructions around it. It was installed in November 2018 and it was decommissioned and removed in 2019. Um, it only recorded GPS frequencies during its operation. Um, Lorg is an example on Christine's web app as well, so you can actually run this case there. So the first thing that we would do with the Jupyter Notebook Im implementation is to um, import the required packages that we have. So the notebooks also include a couple of helpers to help you check your environment variables and also download the required executable for the code as well, which many of you saw in the homeworks. Uh, and just a, a quick comment about the piece of code here that looks a little bit monstrous. Um, I'm just creating a function that does the plots, makes them just a little bit bigger and easier to read for this demonstration, but they're not actually required to run the code. Um, since there is a parameter in Christine's code that allows you to uh, print the plots out so that you don't have to do any plotting. So it's pretty Python new friendly. So the first thing that you do is downloading the SNR file. We're going to choose the day 205 in the year 2019 to look at. Um, we're also here going to save the lat long and height information that we'll use for the analysis later on. And then here running the Rhinox to SNR. Normally you will see a success down here, but I've run all of these ahead of time so that we don't have to wait for the files to download just for the purpose of the demonstration. So the next thing we'll do is use Quick Look to produce these periodograms. Um, the default is L1. Perfect, so this does look pretty good for this uh, site. It looks like we're not going to need an azimuth mask as the range goes pretty much all the way across. Um, because we know that there's no significant topographic features near the station, uh, we're just gonna use the default values for elevation mask and we're not gonna apply an azimuth mask as well. So then we can compare the periodograms for the other frequencies. In this case, we can look at L2C and L5. And just another note for the functions that we can call here in the Jupyter Notebooks. If you ever want to look at what the function does or what the parameters are or the defaults, you can add a question mark to the end of the function. This will print out what the function's parameters are. It has the default values, and you can also read the doc string, which has some explanations as to what the values you can put here. Can so we, in this case, yep. I was just going to say, uh, could, 
could you show your, I don't know, the, yeah, the reflector high peak to noise amplitude that just, I was just going to point out just something. Do you see how between 300 and 350, the amplitudes have gone down? Does that, do you see how they've gone down? But do you see how her reflector height values are very consistent? And these are being flagged as good retrievals, which I think they are. So I just wanted to, if you could go back and show them the picture though. <clears throat> I mean, so the GPS antenna is somewhere on there. I'd have to even look. So this wasn't like this had no crap around it. It did have crap around it. And I think possibly one of the reasons the amplitudes went down there is simply because there's crap. So, I, so, the, so the nice thing about the plot she's showing you is she can give you an idea of the azimuth changes. And yet, even when there is lower amplitude retrievals, you still get these quite nice uh, retrievals in a very, you wouldn't think Antarctica would be filled with um, clutter, <laughs> but sometimes it is. Okay, I just wanted to show people the pick. Yeah, and hopefully no airplanes park next. next no, door. no airplanes. <laughs> Great. Um, so I guess, where was I? Yes, uh, so with a quick look, just uh, as a reminder, if you ever forget what the different values are that we have for um, switching the frequencies, you can always take a look here. So if we want to look at L2C, we'll set our F value to 20. And for L5, we'll set F to 5, which we'll see here. So beautiful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then for L5. They do look pretty good. As Christine mentioned before, these ones, you can see that there's, you know, less satellite tracks because these uh, L2C and L5 were uh, implemented with the station and the satellites later. Perfect. So once we look at this and we, we kind of know the um, azimuth mask and elevation mass that we would want to set, which in this case, we're going to stick with the default values, we move on to analyze the data. Um, the first thing that we'll do is we'll make the JSON file, which um, we'll just add the station lat long and height that we saved previously as a variable. And if we wanted to take a look at what that JSON file is, we can always print that out. All right, so then next we would be making the SNR files for the time span. In this case, we're going to choose about eight months. Um, we'll do day of year one through 233. Um, we can also restrict our search to use the UNAVCO archive, uh, which might run a little faster so it doesn't have to search through other archives before finding the files we want. Um, in this case, I'm going to skip these two sections because I've run them ahead of time, but you, what you would do is run right next to SNR, and then you could run the GNSSIR after that. And then once that would be complete uh, running, we would then run, in this case, we're going to look at the daily averages, so there's a function that we have for the daily average, which Christine spoke about. In this case, um, we are going to set a median filter of uh, 0.25 and set required tracks to be 50. This also does have a uh, plot to screen feature, which we can set to true. So then a bunch of plots will actually spit up for you. So you don't have to do any plotting, but I did use the values that it comes with reading in the files that are saved, which are printed here. Uh, and then we can uh, plot these ourselves if that's something we're interested in doing. So this first plot would be all of the reflector heights. So each color is a day. We could then look at the number of reflector heights that we have used for the daily average for each day, just like the previous plot that Christine showed. And then the last one we would look at is the actual, the daily average. So these in this reflector heights would then give information about the snow accumulation here at Lori. Um, again, like Christine mentioned, we've reversed the y-axis so that the reflector height gets smaller as the snow layer increases. The distance between the antenna and the snow surface then decreases. I'll just so that would be, uh, uh, go ahead. That Kelly has more required tracks. I think I was using, I don't know, 25 or 30 in Greenland. 30. She's using multiple frequencies. So she has more, uh, more data. So she can up that a little bit, which means she can be a little more confident um, of the retrievals. <clears throat> 
All right, so the next case we're gonna go over um, was the case that Christine spoke about before, which is Niwat on Niwat Ridge in Colorado. So like um, it was mentioned, Niwat Ridge was originally designed to support GNSS, excuse me, GPS reflections research. Um, the site was hosted at Niwat Ridge Leader, which is very useful because we can get in situ data, which is the pole next to it. Um, the site itself is uh, three meters above the bare soil surface, which is good. And it's also good to know that it tracked L2C. So we can take a look at that as well with a quick look. So in this example, we're going to look at data between 2009 and 2015. But the first thing we'll do is run our imports. And then we're going to just take a look at one day. We're going to choose uh, year 2014, day of year uh, 270. In this case, we're going to use what we're calling the special archive, which is what Christine mentioned about decimating the um, one second data to 15 seconds. Uh, we have this, uh, these files in a special archive, which we can then access. So we'll look at the L1 frequency. So these um, do look a little bit busy in the low reflector height area, but we do are we are seeing some pretty strong peaks in uh, some of the southern uh, quadrants or a few of the quadrants. We can look at the metrics as well, and here we can see already that there may be some azimuth ranges that we could remove once we do the analysis. So if we want to look at the L2 frequency, we'd set F to 2, which is different than setting F to 20, which is just L2C. So this will be uh, L2, including L2C. But we are seeing a lot of failed tracks down at the bottoms of these periodograms. Did so looking at them more than I'm sorry, Kelly, did you tell them what's causing those gray ones down at the bottom? No. Yeah, go ahead. OK, so uh, so. Yeah, Kelly, uh, she can pick L2 or L2C. So L2 would be all the satellites in the file for L2. And that would mean L2C and non-L2C. So the gray things are the non-L2C satellites. And that's why I don't like them, is that these really oh. low amplitudes. And then we have a special flag, which she's also gonna show you where you say, okay, no, no, I only want the L2C. So all the L2 data are in the files so that geodesists could use it if they wanted to, but we added this extra flag, which she's gonna use in the next plot so that you don't have to bother trying to analyze the L2P data. Okay. Yeah, perfect. And so then the next thing we'll do is look at the L2C data by setting F to 20. And once these periodograms show up, we will see that we, don't, we no longer have these failed tracks here. And then it looks pretty good. The other thing uh, I would point out um, is that, you know, I originally, to make multiple years, which had starting and stopping times, you used to have to kind of do a laborious process, which uh, Kelly had to follow because that was, in fact, how the code worked. But now you can say, go from June 15, 2010 to January 1st, some other year. So we, we've, uh, that was thanks to Makan, I, I did update that recently so that you don't have to do them year by year. But that, that was, I did that after the use case was already done, so. Right, yeah, that is true. Um, great, so uh, after we've looked at the different um, periodograms using Quick Look, we're going to go into the analysis section. I just scrolled back up to the metrics uh, to get a, an idea and kind of describe which we had you do over the homework, how to read these. So I'm not gonna go over them again, but looking at these, we're going to choose a, a peak to noise of about three and a spectral ampli amplitude of eight. And then we're just gonna stick with the Southern quadrant. So we're gonna choose azimuths from 90 to 270. And I'll show you how we would um, change those in the um, Jupyter notebook version uh, since the make JSON section, you need to, uh, edit it manually, you can still do that within the notebook. So we would be downloading these files. We would look through, and we're going to do fall 2009 through spring 2015. 
again, I'll skip this because this one actually does take a, quite a long time because that's many years to go over. So we will make the uh, make the JSON function and um, we'll set uh, the elevation angle to seven. This is for the, I believe the same reason you just mentioned previously, Christine. Um, yeah, it's a receiver thing. Don't, it's not a mask, but it's a receiver thing. Yeah, which just shows that sometimes it, it, you do need a lot of information about the site itself and what's going on there. Um, setting our peak to noise and our amplitude. Then we can take a look at what our JSON file is but we know that we want to change our azimuth range and we also are going to uh, remove the L5 frequency because we're not interested in looking at that. And so in that, there is some code here for you that would help you open the file, edit it and save it again. So here we are changing our azimuth range from 90 to 270 and then our frequency, we're just going to do L1 and L2C here. And we can print it out, make sure that we can see that those changes are made. And then we would run GNSSIR for the same range. Um, it is, uh, it's fine to run GNSSIR for not the exact range that you downloaded the files in. So you can see here, I'm just doing day of year one and day end 365 um, because it will skip if the file doesn't exist. So if I only downloaded files that's within that range, that's fine too. And then we would compute the daily average reflector height values. Here, um, we're actually going to set uh, the uh, required tracks to 10, if we can see that here, which is much less than 50. Um, it's relatively low. Um, and this is because of the small number of L2C transmitting satellites in the early years of this data set. So um, it is important to know this information when you're running these, or helpful at least. This one has a lot of data, so it takes just a second. It does print out again where the files are, and then we can read those files and plot them. So these would be all of the total reflector heights. Then we can also look at the average number that they use for the daily average of the reflector heights. And then we can also print out the daily average. So pretty. So um, because, uh, as was mentioned, the site does have in situ data, um, we will compare that to what's called poll 16, which is the poll that you can see in the image. So the first thing that we're going to do for that is um, to calculate um, a general estimate of the bare soil um, by taking a couple of days or taking the days from uh, August to mid-September, and we're going to determine that average snow or ground level to be the bare soil height. From there, we're gonna read in the data from poll 16. We're gonna take the days that we're interested in that we've plotted above. We wanna compare that to the same values for the in situ data. And then lastly, we can plot them together. And then this would show the same plot that Christine showed previously. And as she mentioned, uh, it is important to note that the pole measurements aren't necessarily representative of the same footprint, since the GPS measurements cover an average over a much larger region. Um, but in this example, we're not going to do any more quantitative comparisons because there's already several publications on this. Um, could you go back to your reflector height one without the, yeah. I just wanted to point this out. Um, uh, let me see if I can, um, can you like between 2013 and 2014, do you see how it all melts and then it kind of, yeah, there, yeah. Okay, so basically zero is gonna be set about right where Kelly's cursor was, right? Go up, yeah, that's where she's gonna set zero. And do you see how there are some, you know, pretty consistent points below that? You see that little curvy thing? Okay, that's, in my lab, that was called negative snow, <laughs> negative snow depth. And I banned negative snow depth from our conversations. But I mean, if you set zero to where Kelly's pointing, those points would show up as negative snow depth. They aren't negative snow depth. <laughs> it means 
typically is if you have a very small snow layer on top of bare soil, you can see through the snow. So you get a reflection both from the soil and from the snow. It's only relevant for relatively small, possibly slushy snow, I don't know, but it, it persistently happens. You throw it out. That's just the way it is. We, it's good to know what causes it, um, but it's not a new discovery. It's called having double reflectors at similar frequencies uh, interfering with each other and producing a dominant frequency that is neither. So um, yeah, I just wanted, in case you see that thing, you're, the, 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 the solution is to not use the minimum there as snow depth. You wanna use your bare soil before the snow shows up, not as it's just about to melt or has just melted. So uh, you might be concerned with, well, anyway, that's just, I just wanted to point that out. I don't know if anybody saw it, but it is an issue. The other thing I'd say about this um, example is thanks to Mark Williams and the Niwot Ridge LTER, you know, they had 20 years of measurements or so from that field. And so we could say, well, what's the most snow you've ever had? And they're like, well, it looks like two and a half meters. Well, you know, in 2012 there, they basically got to that level. Our antenna was almost buried. So make sure your sensor preferably is a, always a meter above your highest level that you're trying to, I mean, in this case, we actually were less than that, but uh, that's the goal. I would like you to always be a meter above your highest level. That was great, Kelly. It's very nice. You can stop sharing. Yeah, so I think we can just take um, uh, questions. I guess they're running up here. So Andrea, I saw your uh, question about why are there measurements that satisfy amplitude and peak to noise, but they're not marked as good. And I think that's buried in one of the videos, but it is worth bringing it up again. Um, we have split things up in a way so that we can easily analyze hundreds of tracks per day. And we haven't necessarily rescued or kept every single track. And in some cases, the way we parameterize the data, a satellite might start in one azimuth bin and end in another. And it doesn't meet my internal requirements for a good track, which, we, which you don't control explicitly. I can show you where you can try to control it, but the idea is I don't want you to compute snow depth for a track that goes between five to 10 degrees and treat it as good as one that goes from five to 25. Okay, does that make sense? So um, I want you to have good long tracks for what you're trying to measure. Now it could be that you're doing something where you're only using five to 15, but let's say you're using five to 25. I don't want you creating outliers with these tiny tracks that only go between 10 and 14 elevation angle. So there's some internal checks in the code that says, that satellite hasn't gone high enough. You're trying to compare little tracks with big tracks, or in some cases, you're going from one azimuth bin to another azimuth bin, so you never get high enough for, in either one. Um, so it, it really is an attempt to be conservative and to not use tracks that don't have enough data in them to give you a good periodogram. And even though you do get measurements to the north in um, Greenland, and in, in Alaska, they, the satellites don't rise as high as they do in the other quadrants. And so that's probably why it's being triggered. If say five to 15 were used, possibly fewer would be triggered, but then you wouldn't have as good a, a periodogram. So I can talk to you about that offline, but it has to do mostly with how we've parameterized the estimation in an attempt to be conservative and not you know, produce files that aren't well, or estimates that aren't well determined is the answer to that question. So uh, can you guys throw questions so I don't pick these without, I don't know. 
All right, okay, I'll pick one on. Often GP GPS antennas are surrounded by some kind of fence. Um, this is a big problem. You know, actually it depends on the, how big the little things are, the, the little squares. So like um, a um, barbed wire, I don't know if people use barbed wire everywhere. Those, I could care less about barbed wire because, you know, usually things are really, they're not finely meshed. But if you use finely meshed wire, first of all, shame on you for putting that near your GPS site. And secondly, it's as if you've put a big sheet of metal near your antenna. Now, if it's below your antenna, that's probably okay. But if you have these large metal things above your antenna, that, that's bad. Um, I would have thought uh, a lot of PBO sites were set in, in um, I'm not sure if you call them agricultural areas, but there were cattle grazing. We actually had a flag at our portal as to whether there were grazing animals near the site. <clears throat> and you would have thought that would kill the site for reflectometry, but the reality is, you know, when you looked at the videos and you did your homework, the reflection area is really big. So, you know, those cow enclosures were typically below the antenna and the reflection zones were well outside those cow masking areas. So uh, you usually get away with it, but sometimes in sea level applications, there are way too many obstructions near the antennas. Uh, it just depends. Can someone ask the question so I don't have to read? So Tim, maybe? Sure, yeah, uh, let's see. Could I mean, you I can't get anything from Slack? So could you? Yeah. So someone asked, could you explain some of the reasons behind the spread or precision in reflector height? Is it due to environmental noise or instrumental noise? So is the question, why don't you get the same answer at all azimuths? I... Uh, let's see. Well, unless you're living in a completely horizontal world where things are perfectly flat, you shouldn't expect things to be the same answer at all azimuths. Um, for pretty flat sites, and a lot of uh, the good sites that I use are pretty flat, <clears throat> you can get uncertainties of about a centimeter to two, one to two centimeters. Um, this isn't geodesy. <clears throat> We're not trying to do millimeter reflectometry. Some people have shown some really good sea level retrievals uh, that are better than that, but I guess, I, you know, the ground isn't perfectly flat. It's, it has roughness and that's the way it is. And someone asks, how can you control the tropospheric model used? So the only place we uh, do anything with the troposphere is the refraction error, which is a pretty simple um, correction. And it has to do with the uh, elevation angle bending which does affect um, reflector height for tall sites. It's almost nothing for two meter sites. So for the snow people, this is really irrelevant. But um, for people that wanna do sea level from towers, you will, and this relates to Neil's question, you really do wanna get this in ITRF correctly and you won't get it correctly if you have a refraction error in there. So uh, we used, um, what are they called? The, the Vienna mapping functions was a first order correction and it works pretty well. And in fact, I make it, you, it's hard to turn it off. I make you, you have to put some effort into turning it off because I don't want you to turn it off, right? It's a small effect for people that are close to the ground but I don't really see the point of turning it off. I do put a column in the results saying whether you've applied it or not because that way you can track it. The worst thing you can do is compare results with and without a refraction correction because you'll waste your time looking at biases that don't exist. But I do not, this is not geodesy. This is not gamut, not gypsy, not Bernese. We do not estimate the troposphere in the same way. We don't use their corrections. We don't, what we use is the information that went into building those mapping functions by the Vienna group. And we use that to correct elevation angle bending, because remember, we're not doing ranging. 
So the reason the refraction correction is such a big deal for geodesy is it causes a change in the range and it has an elevation angle dependence. Remember, we have an observable that affects everything identically up until that little reflection, right? I mean, it causes a beating, but does it cause a huge difference in the range? No. And that's why you get away with doing very little for short sites. I'm not saying you shouldn't always correct it. You should. I would be happy to include other refraction corrections if people would provide them to me in Python in a way that they can be used easily. I'd be happy to add that. See, someone asks, can this software be expanded into the GLONASS FDMA signal? Is there any caveat of applying this SNR method onto the FDMA signals? It's already being used for FDMA. Dash FR101. Is L1 GLONASS? This code is 100% multi GNSS. I think the MATLAB codes that we published in 2008 were not 2018, but these you can use Galileo, GLONASS, or Beidou. All of them. It's in the, the default is GPS just out of convenience, but um, in my experience, it's easier to find those signals in RINEX3, but you can often find them in RINEX2 and they're great. I love Galileo and I love GLONASS and I love Beidou. So now you've heard it. I love L2C and L5. I have ambivalent feelings about L1 GPS. It can be noisy for some receivers. It's still useful, but the answer to that question is I, GLONASS is great. Then someone asks, can this method be used when the station is moving, for example, 10 kilometers a day? Um, I think if you want to do that, then you should compute your own azimuth and elevation angles and give it a try. So of course, our code uses the RINEX header to say where you are. And of course, where you are is not going to be the same every epoch if you're moving 10 kilometers a day, right? So you should build your own code that computes azimuth and elevation angle for your moving receiver. And this is a common issue, right? On airplanes or any kind of moving um, platform and, and give it a go. Uh, there's no reason, it, I, I'm not saying it won't work, but you have to do your own work to do the conversion to take into account the moving platform. Now, if you're on an ice sheet, those guys think those are moving fast and they are, but they're not moving that 10 kilometers a day. So we used to have an option to change those externally and it just had almost no impact whatsoever. Um, but certainly if your Rhinex header has pretty good information in it, it'll work even on a fast moving glacier. But that's a good question. Would you like some more questions? <laughs> We have two, one and a half minutes, then we'll take a break and then we'll do water. But you have until 1130. So, someone asks, what would cause the second peak effect, mainly in the Northwest quadrant in the periodogram from the Ross station? I don't know if we can- Northwest peak. So uh, Ross is, uh, did you look at the pictures? Why do you want to go across a pier? So uh, Ross, um, actually, you, if you can crawl the screen, um, Tim, why don't you open a browser and go gnss-reflections.org slash geoid, I guess. Well, yeah, slash geoid. I mean, actually, I think I'd do that in the next time, but let's just show that if you can get it going. If not, well. Do you see this? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Try putting Ross in there and just hit. I'm not sure if you get it good enough to look at it. So why don't you open that Google map and make it big? I guess, yeah, that thing. And then scoot it up. <laughs> All right, so you're asking why I can't go to the Northwest there. Why do you want to go to the Northwest there? That'd be my comment. <laughs> No, I'm kidding you. Um, 
I'm not saying you can't get water reflections there, but it looks a lot busier to go to the left than the right. Would you agree? And also there are off, sometimes boats over there, right? So I'm, I'm sort of conservative that way is like, but, but I, I'm not saying you can't get reflections from the West, you probably can. Um, I, I, you know, I wanna be able to trust my retrievals. But we're gonna talk about Ross in the next uh, uh, session. So it is now 11.30, we're stopping at one. So let's take a 15 minute break. We'll come back, do water, and then we'll finish up. Does that sound good, Tim, Kelly? Okay. I will try to pick up my screen here. Okay. All right. Can everybody see something that looks like uh, a GPS antenna near the water? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. This is Jeff Brymuller's uh, site again in Peterson Bay. Um, I think Clara Chu took the picture though. I could be wrong. Anyway, so uh, to tell you what I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna go over some basics. So the idea is get a sort of like a 10 minute overview on uh, water. And then I'm gonna show you the command line with two examples, and Kelly's gonna show you Jupyter Notebooks with two examples. All right, and then we're gonna take questions and sort of move into the final Q&A uh, from there. All right, so I, I found this lovely plot somewhere. Where did I get this? I don't know. It's meant to convey that measuring sea level is complicated. Measuring sea level in a datum with respect to a well-defined reference frame is difficult. Um, you know, GPS is just one of the tools they use to try and take a tide gauge, which is usually on a, on a, a pier, to a datum, which might be over here, but they use the GPS now to get to that datum. They used to use leveling. A uh, complicated process, uh, wouldn't it be nice if we could just get rid of everything except for the GPS? So that's not actually my goal, but it is a showing you that there are some simplicities associated with GPS that could be useful um, as a tide gauge. I'm not actually a big uh, promoter of replacing tide gauges. I look at it more as an opportunity to add more tide gauges. So I'm not saying get rid of the ones you have. All right, so the pluses of a tide gauge using GNSS, as Neil's question in the first section, it's defined in ITRF, you have to do a phase center correction, but uh, the reflection part can be added to the positioning part. Um, a good friend of mine said, it's a plus to have no moving parts in salty water. So let's give it that. It, in that regard, it could be a niche tide gauge for polar regions. Now it can be far from shore, but that's, don't be crazy. It can't be too far. Uh, you have to be able to see the reflections. Uh, you could use a cheap sensor. Uh, there's been quite a few studies that show that those work very well. And we haven't talked about it here. We have no model in our current code, but you can do significant wave height uh, with GPS as well. So the negatives are, I don't like high winds. I just threw this number out here, but I don't. don't. Uh, Kelly has an example <clears throat> where it was very windy at TGHO one day. Uh, you can use a GPS tag gauge in high-ish winds, but when it gets crazy, you can't. Um, I would say it doesn't work in busy environments, and busy means buildings and boats and stuff like that. So, you know, be sensible if you set out a new site. Um, I think one of the negatives is it's new and people don't wanna do new things. I think that's just the way it is. Um, and I, I think that despite the fact that there are many useful sites, um, there are many non-useful sites and you're just gonna have to accept that. Um, they'll never work. So at first glance, this is as an acceptable site, uh, but I can look at it and say it's too far from the shore. And you could say, how can you know that? Well, I've looked at hundreds of photographs of unsuccessful sites. This antenna needed to be much closer to the shore and that's even without my knowing which way it's looking. All right, uh, if you look on the map, 
you realize, well, okay, it must have been looking that way. Yellow is five degrees. I want to go from five to 15 and really 10 to 15 and basically parts of five degrees are on land. So it doesn't work. Um, and it also is near a boat harbor. And so this is all obstructed. So it, a photograph by itself can tell me some things, but um, usually the access to Google Earth is very helpful for understanding why things don't work. Not always, but it's usually very helpful. So uh, my view about water is you start with a lake. You don't do tides, you do a lake. Uh, this is actually a more complicated surface because it's water in the summer and it's ice in the winter, but it is free data, so let's go to it. Uh, I didn't see Joe on the call, so maybe he didn't come to my class, but um, here is a GPS site put in by Natural Resources Canada. It's the Ross station that someone was asking about in the last uh, session. Uh, you can use my Geoid app to both find out, oh, I don't know, you, to get your Google map. Uh, here's the reflection zone mapping part. I played with it a little. Now, remember, you can't use mean sea level for an interior lake as your reflector height because this site is quite high. You want to know how high it is above the water. That's the more important thing. Um, this is what I ended up using. Uh, I just don't see this as very attractive over here. Uh, I don't know what that is, but it, I don't like it. Um, I'm, I'm worried about the yellow regions over here, um, but you know, this is my first cut using 5, 10, and 15 degrees for these azimuths. It sure looks like things are parking there and we don't wanna be, uh, be obstructed by those. So these are um, my, I translated a file and then I use Quick Look and uh, reflector height is on the x-axis. And I uh, see that I get some nice, oh, this uh, looks quite, sorry. It's quite nice here in the southeast. So the quadrant I kind of showed you. Um, yeah, this looks a little dicey. You know, maybe maybe I could get into the uh, you know that quadrant a little bit, but I'm probably going to stick with this quadrant. So uh, we also get this plot where we have azimuth on the x-axis, peak to noise. Here it's kind of fallen down uh, in terms of the peak to noise, su suggesting it's very noisy. In fact, those are quite low values. Um, this looks pretty darn good. Now, there might be some places where uh, I should have gotten a retrieval and didn't, but uh, you can play with, for example, the peak to noise a little bit if you want. Uh, I am only using L1 at this site because that's the only useful one I consider to be useful. I'm using elevation angle range 5 and 15 when I make my JSON. I hand edited the uh, azimuths and uh, analyzed a year of data. Then I use daily average. Uh, I don't have the plot here. And here's my take home message. This is tracking signals that were developed in the 1970s, and that's it. So I suggest they track L2C, L5. Uh, I know that L5 can be complicated if you don't have a new antenna, but there's no reason to not be tracking L2C. And I don't. I don't, I, I looked, it seems to be capable of, of tracking the other net, the other constellations, but that's really up to the people that own the site. Uh, Friday Harbor, you know, it's a lot of papers have been written about it. It's not actually that great a site. It is obstructed by this island in, in most directions. It looks like it's right over the water, but I assure you it's not. It's, it's actually set back a little bit, <clears throat> which is unfortunate uh, for me. I mean, <laughs> maybe it's fine for everybody else. So if it had been a little, a little closer, uh, we could get more elevation angle range. I usually don't go above 13 degrees at this site. Um, I already showed you some results. It showed you the daily averages agree quite well. The monthly averages agree quite well with the tide gauge that NOAA operates. I just uh, kept this in here. This is from the same paper. This is uh, Richard Ray's work. Um, he does all my title 
uh, comparisons. And he was able to look at the longer time series and show, you know, that these tidal coefficients, which are the things people talk about at these sites, agree better than a centimeter for every coefficient except for two of them, which itself is only about 1.3 centimeters long. So this was using only L1. It was a 10 year comparison, but at that time that receiver was primarily uh, running L1. It had a little bit of L2C, but you know the satellites at that point were being launched routinely and I was worried about possible errors from that uh, variability. So I just used L1, but even then we still had excellent results. Uh, what if I look at the new data from that site? So that paper is old, very old. I think it used 2006 through 2016 or something like that. Now there's a modern receiver there. It's great. It tracks everything, uh, everything I want. And uh, I picked it up for January 15th of this year, just randomly picked that. I'm going to try a quick look with the defaults. <clears throat> and you can see that a lot of gray, a lot of gray, right? Well, what are the defaults? Remember, the defaults are 5 to 25 degrees. And I said, for the water, I really want to stop at 13. Um, the other thing is, you need to know your tidal range. And it's discussed in the paper in the tidal range here. It is equivalent to reflector heights between 3 and 7. So you don't want to be cutting out your signals. And when you compute these stats, you've been including water reflections, which are variable with soil reflections, which are not. So again, use the tool it's described in the videos to set a better mask. Uh, this is what it looks like when I'm now using 5 to 13 degrees. I'm using heights from 3 to 12. And I'm using L2C. I could use Galileo. I could use uh, I can use GLONASS, I can use Beidou at this site. It's all good, except, I mean, I would like it better if it was closer to the shore, but the constellations are all great. And now this region has turned blue. Remember it was gray before. And that's because I'm allowing reflector heights in the region where they belong. Peaks to noises are quite large and the spectral amplitudes are you know, reasonably large. And where they're not, those are being flagged as gray, as no good. So. So that's the good, much, much better. And people sometimes, well, at least people that are, you know, like let's say they started with snow where remember those blue dots were just straight across the, the screen. Now there's a lot of scatter in the reflector heights and this confuses people sometimes. That's the tides, right? Each one of those blue dots has a time associated with it. Now I'm plotting it for azimuth, but I could just as well say three o'clock, four o'clock, seven o'clock, two o'clock, I mean, right? So those are tides. Um, so I wanna look at a longer time series. I think I ended up just doing 25 days randomly. We could do more examples on this, but this is what I put up at the time. Um, notice here, I'm saying all frequencies true because this is an, a multi-GNSS site. Um, at this site, I don't know why, but now the 15 second data are multi-GNSS. I think there's no Beidou data in there because it's a um, not compliant with RINEX 2.11, but they have RINEX 3 data there. They have one second data. For this site, I think you can get everything you want. So just as a positive there, but I'm just gonna show you these are the results for all the frequencies I use. Uh, that's what tides look like, right? I don't, I don't know everybody's used to looking at them. I do have an outlier criteria. Uh, right now, the preliminary estimates are 10 to 12 centimeters because I haven't taken out the biases. Uh, so I'm using three sigma, so three times 12. Uh, but that can, it's about eight centimeters when you um, clean out the biases and so on. So this is a sort of an, an analog to daily average. It's called subdaily. Just to remind you that paper we were so happy about, 10 years of data. You know, we were happy to get 35 to 40 retrievals per day, and, and, and now we're at like 250. So multi-GNSS is what you should use for water levels, period. I, I can't say whether you have to use it for snow, but for water levels, I think it's really intrinsically important. 
Now, I am, don't have time to talk about the RH dot correction. Um, I have put in a simple way to estimate it uh, that I'm gonna just not talk about. But the first thing I'm showing here is just a straight out comparison of those individual retrievals with the NOAA tie gauge. Excellent comparison, 0.99 correlation, that kind of thing. Oh, I don't have it. Actually, that's interesting. So I guess I was trying not to waste, I not waste, use too much time. I do have code that computes the RH correction for you. Uh, those of you who know what that is can look uh, closer at the uh, use case. But I did want to just show you that there are results and you can, using this software, get pretty good results for um, a tidal comparison. Is it perfect? No, in fact, probably the biggest misfit here are at the, well, let me see, these are low tides. Um, <coughs> and there's probably a pretty good reason for that and it has to do with how we parameterize the problem. And, and we're gonna be working on trying to improve that. But again, it's not millimeter. It's centimeters, and uh, Simon Williams is really the expert on this. And I think he's got some sites where you get two or three centimeters, but typically five is your best using this kind of method. So I think I'm basically done. I do have this plot as just to remind yourself, this particular site, I would never have thought was a tide gauge, but there you go. You can get reflections at about 290 meters. From it. So it, and those are good, strong reflections. So I'm going to leave that as a mystery site. Some of you know which one it is. And I'm going to stop and let Kelly um, talk. And then we'll take questions after that. All right, I'll share my screen. Perfect. All right. So the first case, uh, again, we're going to go over just a couple of use cases. The first one is going to be a lake, and then the second one will be tides. So this one is a lake uh, in New Zealand, Lake Taupo, I think you call it. The station is TGHO. Uh, it's operated by GNS in, in New Zealand. It's also on a platform where you can see in the lake here. It records uh, GPS and GLONASS signals as well, and the sample rates of 30 seconds. First, we'll do our imports. Great, I'm gonna save the lat, long, and height information again. I'm gonna take a, a day of year and year to take a look at with a quick look. Here, I'm gonna set the orb to GNSS. So we'll be looking at more than just the GPS. And we're also setting a, an archive that we have for a New Zealand archive. But first, we'll take a look at the L1 signals. So um, just using the default values, we didn't actually change anything in there. The elevation angles is it's likely combining water and peer reflections. So we're going to change our results from the uh, default, which is 5 to 25, to uh, 5 to 15. We can see if that's going to improve. So here we'll change 15 from 25. Take a look at those again which already look a little better than they did before. We can also change our height estimates um, or our, our minimum and max heights. We're gonna change them from two to eight to kind of get rid of this messy area. So we can change that here and plot this again. So we can see H1 and H2 is where we would make those changes. All right, so that's what the L1 would then look like. So we're gonna keep these changes and we're gonna continue and look onto the other frequencies. So we'll look at L2 data. Which we can see don't look very good. So that tells us that for our analysis, we're gonna remove this from uh, the make JSON file so that we don't use this. The next two, I'm going to plot in one line, but this is going to be looking at um, GLONASS 
frequencies. Uh, so 101 and 102 is what we're setting for those, which is L1 and L2. And these look like they have pretty good peaks. So um, one of the other things for the analysis is we're gonna exclude the 135 about to 225 degrees in azimuth because um, there's an empty region in there. It's also just a couple of core retrievals as well that we could get rid of. We're gonna require an amplitude of nine and a peak to noise ratio of about three. So uh, doing the analysis, we would then run the Rhinox to SNR for the days that we're interested in running. Which will be here. Oh, sorry, I actually, I added this in at the last minute. So I wanted to add in this extra day in here to take a look at because um, we wanted to show what it could look like. If you just pick one day, it won't always show up as necessarily a good day and it could be for many reasons. And in this case, this is a day that has a lot of wind. And so it didn't really get any good retrievals. So uh, if you're using Quick Look and you're looking at one day, it can be really useful to uh, look at more than one day or know information about the day and the site and what's happening. Perfect, so now I'm setting all of the decisions that we made as variables here that I'll pass in to make the JSON file for the analysis. So we can print that out and see what those are. We'll then make the changes that we want to to the JSON file. So we're gonna pick our azimuth range and then we're going to include L1 and then the GLONASS L1 and L2. So now we can see that those changes have been made in the JSON files here. So then we would run the Rhinox to SNR and then the GNS SIR, which again, I'll skip because I did them ahead of time. Um, but once those are complete, we can then uh, use our daily average function. We're gonna set the median filter to 0 0.25. And again, the required tracks for this one will be 50. We'll let that run. And then we can plot. So these would be all of the reflector heights, which again, each color is a day. Then we can show the number of counts that we have for the daily average. And then lastly, we can then plot the water levels using the daily average. All right, so the next case that we're gonna go over, unless you had any other comments on that, Christine? Oh, no, I, um, they look great. Uh, just to, as a reminder, um, <clears throat> Kelly showed you the number of retrievals per day and the screen also printed out, not enough retrievals, not enough retrievals. <clears throat> Here. Uh, when she's not having enough retrievals, that's probably a windy day. That's my only comment. Yeah, so we can actually see, let's see, this is the day that I showed that was a very windy day. And the other uh, comment would just be, there's a, a missing dates in the time, final time series she showed. Um, you know, to be honest, there, there might not be any data at all. Uh, this site in particular doesn't necessarily have a, a, a file every day. So that's part of it. But I would encourage you to look at the use case online as Lucas Holden um, from Melbourne has done a paper on this particular data set. I think he looked at 10 years of data and he compared to uh, tide gauges on the shore, uh, which are not tied to ITRF. And it, it, it shows quite the difficulty of using those. So I think if you wanna look at a lake uh, comparison, he's done a really good job and uh, you can look at the paper. It's I think uh, <clears throat> it's linked to the use case. And um, yeah, so all of these use cases are up on Christine's uh, GitHub account on in Markdown files, the Jupyter Notebooks. I'm also going to be posting these if you want to run through them yourself uh, after the course today. Let me just move this out of the way. Perfect. So um, the next case we're going to go over is looking at tides. So this is the station AT01 at St. Michael Bay in Alaska. 
Um, so the site in general has, has a decent visibility over um, a region that's uh, on a monument about a meter taller than the normal geodetic monuments. Um, and it also, that helps improve the visibility out to the ocean, which is great. AT01 does observe all constellation signals. So we will be using several of them as we go through. So just importing again. So in this case, uh, I'm going to take a look at and show you. Um, so this is Christine's web app that we can pull up in the Jupyter Notebook. If I type the station in here, we can actually take a look at it, um, which is nice. So I can grab the lat long and height from here if I wanted to also be able to look at the pier. So just from looking at this, we're gonna guess that we're probably gonna remove the Northwest section. Um, but we will be able to confirm that with the QC once we go through quick look. We can also look at the reflection zones here and play with them if we want to. So if I submitted that with the station, we can see these zones that uh, Christine was, was showing previously and we can make changes to it. So if I wanted to change this to say 240 and see what that would look like for the station, then we can see what that would look like. So this is a really useful tool for trying to figure out your initial uh, assumptions. Um, also, one thing to note with this one is that since we aren't measuring at sea level, it's good to note that this uh, station is 12 meters above sea level. So first we'll run right next to SNR. We're gonna choose day of year 109 for the year 2020. And then we're going to look at L1. And we're not going to change any of the defaults initially. So without changing any of the defaults, we immediately could look at this and say that it may not be a good site. But it's important to remember that for some sites, it, you will need to be changing the defaults. So um, just to remind myself of what the defaults are, I can always look at this function again. And I can you know, remember that the initial height that we have set to is between 0 0.5 and 6. Um, but we already know that the site is 12 meters above sea level. So we're going to change that to encompass 12 meters. So we'll change the height to 8 to 15. And we're also going to change the elevation angles to 5 and 13. We're going to print the periodograms for L1 again. And so now we're actually getting retrievals. And it looks like um, looking at the QC, we can see that we're getting it all the way from zero to about 220, 240 or so, which it makes sense because that's what we are initially looking at from the uh, Fresnel zone reflection zone mapping here. So it's good that we can confirm that here and along with our intuition. So next we'll look at L2C, where we set F to 20. And then here I'll also print out GLONASS uh, and uh, Galileo. So for I'll do 101 for GLONASS and Galileo is uh, we'll set to 205 for the frequency values. So this is GLONASS. And then this one will be Galileo. So moving on to analyzing the data, um, we're going to analyzed for about two months in the fall of 2020. So we set day of year 230 to the day of year end at 290. We're gonna set the orb to GNSS since we do wanna use those and the archive to UNESCO as well. And then we're going to make our JSON file. Here we set all frequencies to true, just like Christine mentioned previously. We can take a look at the JSON file um, but we are going to make a couple of changes manually to the JSON file. So we are going to edit out. We're going to go about to 220. 
for the azimuth range and then the frequencies we're going to get rid of the Bayview frequencies as well as uh, 208 will remove. And it turns out that the Beidou data aren't in the Rhinex 2 file that's online. And, and we could have gotten them from Rhinex 3, and it was just easier not to show them. But Beidou also works. And if you use the Rhinex 3 file for this site, you can, I believe, successfully use Beidou. Perfect. Um, and then, yeah, more recently, so Chris, uh, Christine did show that she has a sub daily function. Uh, we only recently ported this to the Jupyter Notebooks. So setting PLT to true will send all the plots to the screen from Christine's code, which is great. So we can see the retrievals for each day. We can see the sub-daily reflector heights as well. And then these are plots that are showing uh, the effort for uh, computing the RH dot correction as well. Um, and where we'll point out that uh, the residuals with the RH dot correction versus without the RH dot correction are showing that it's better. And then it also prints out some values for you as well and uh, saves the file and it'll show where the files are so that you can work with that data. Um, sounds good, thank you. So um, I, I think it'd be okay to just take some questions now about water. And then um, after that, we'll just switch gears and just talk about the future and get some feedback, hopefully, or answer more questions from everybody. So can people on Slack or um, uh, chat um, ask questions? Which, uh, or not. <laughs> uh, say hi to Art Neil, I guess, and Pedro to the person who, all right, go ahead. It looks like Neil has his hand up. All right, you're so polite, Neil. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so I had uh, two oh, it's fascinating stuff. It's, it's breaking my brain um, in a good way. So it, considering a tidal station, if you had an area that actually had a surf zone, would it make more sense to put a station up higher, put a, the, the receiver higher and have the reflection come out farther off of the, because I saw you talking about, or you mentioned the, no, no, doing no. the go ahead. I, I, whenever I see people that show reflection zones like crashing waves, I just freak out. But I think you're exactly right. Uh, taller would be better. Mm -hmm. Sure. And that would pull out a better significant wave height too, I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, I really would like to add a significant wave height. Uh, just the, the short answer to that. And I didn't show all the um, applications people have shown because uh, there have been others. There's just a time constraint is basically, you know, I go, ooh, and ah, those nice strong peaks, right? What, that's, that's what mm -hmm. I love in lakes. But, you know, as that peak spreads out, that's telling you about significant wave height. So it's pretty straightforward to come up with that significant wave height because, I mean, the reflector height just gets the peak and then we try to say, well, the peak's significant, but it's that spread that will tell you significant wave height. Not, I'm pretty sure that Simon Williams has, you know, some good work that shows how it could be done more routinely. There have been some academic papers that show results for that that are a little more complicated, but I, I would like to include that and I do think taller is better for that. Sure. Okay, that makes sense then. So on, uh, I'll, I'll be respectful and quick with my <laughs> other couple of technical ones. Um, uh, so I have one station I happen to be looking at. It has a not great coverage. It's the one that you and I had talked about before that's on the bay side of Assateague Island. And it, it's to the north is its section, is its reflection zone. Right. Is it MDAI? Yeah, yeah. That's my baby. That's um, okay. If you use GLONASS and GPS. Okay. But the the thing I ran into on the on the tool was trying to put a reflection zone. And and it's probably it's probable that I just didn't entirely understand it, but its its zone would have been ideally somewhere like 350 degrees to 45 it's degrees or something minus. like that. So use minus, so use minus 20 to you can put minuses in there. In fact, it's looking for that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? I mean, you know, how do you I can't, I can't let you put positive 
you know what I mean. Like, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm laughing because I feel like I should have thought of that, but yes, thank no, you. No, no. It's only added because somebody in Iceland wanted to look at northern, you know, azimuths, and he said, "Why don't sure. you do that?" And I'm like, "I don't know. You guys are so pushy." <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Just kidding. If there are any Icelandic people there, anyways, for the tool, you are allowed to go negative. I think all the way to minus ninety, but. And then in the JSON, you can, of course, specify your own azimuth ranges, but we can fix that. I mean, I think you can get what you need. Excellent. Thank you. And the last... I'm positive you need to kill that plant. <laughs> in front of I, I felt a little bad about that, but um, in general, tree, no trees in front of your GPS site. That's the rule. But um, that problem will be solved this winter. Yeah, if there's no satellites in that direction, then you don't want to kill the tree. That would be mean. Sure. So, right. That would be mean. <laughs> so, uh, those of you who are listening, in the thing with GLONASS is it has a higher inclination. So, when it crosses the equator, it's got a higher inclination. And that means you get better coverage at the northern quadrants, you know in the regions we're talking about in the, in the US. And so GLONASS can actually be better for those Northern quadrants. Uh, so uh, GPS is 55 degrees inclination with respect to the um, equator. Sure. All right, so Tim, you wanna take the next one, next question? Looks like there's one in the chat that says, I guess the rough sea caused so many non-retrievals on a windy day. Yes. So how long the re does the reflector have to be quiet to make a reflection or retrieval? I think it's... Yeah. Um, most of the reflections, uh, I, it's in the result files, but a typical 15, 20 minutes uh, is a typical value, uh, 15 to 20. But if it's windy, <laughs> Sometimes it's windy the whole day. I mean, so um, if you, and, yeah. And then someone asks, I would like to know your assumptions on GNSSIR applications from non uh, MEO orbit GNS satellites. For example, some Beidou geo, geostationary or QZSS IGSO. So the question is basically can you, so, so GPS, GNSS Galileo. GLONASS satellites all have about 12 hour orbits. So satellites rise and set. And remember it's that rising and setting that create the interference pattern that we use to estimate the frequency, which gives us reflector height. So if you are gonna try to use a geostationary satellite, there ain't no rising and there ain't no beating pattern and you don't get reflector height. So my, no, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong, but that's not the future. I mean, something we're not talking about here is doing reflections from space. And there's some really cool, very cool results uh, using reflections from, that have been uh, uh, observed using a satellite. And that's a different game. But uh, for ground-based, I don't really see a future in using those uh, geostationary satellites. But I, you could prove me wrong, but I don't think so. And, oh, we just got one more. Could you comment on why some receivers are better than others for the purpose of GNSSIR? Is it really um, the I, data they record? I, you know, I've heard two theories, and these were actually from receiver manufacturers that I will not out. Um, sure, L, the L1 signal is different than the L2C or L5 signals. Absolutely true. There are some issues with interference issues. Because it's a course, right? It's a course acquisition code. Uh, people talked about that a lot. And that's why the L1 was noisier than the L2C. <clears throat> we know why L2P is bad. That's not an issue. We know why. Um, so I got, you know, I, uh, people talk about this all the time. But then a new receiver manufacturer produces beautiful L1 SNR data. And it's the same L1 signal, right? So that makes sense. So why? And the reason why was also promoted by a receiver manufacturer. He just said, you know, when L2C was created, 
Uh, we wrote a new SNR estimator for our receivers for it. Like we wrote new code. <laughs> so, so theory number two is you check to see how recently the receiver manufacturer wrote the code being used to create the SNR data stream. Because after all, it isn't what they sell to people. They're selling the phase and the pseudo range data. That's what they get paid for. The SNR data is important, but I'm the only person who uses it, as far as I can tell, and you guys. So they don't care about it too much. And people have asked me who makes bad SNR data, and I won't tell you, either on a video or in writing. I will talk to you on the telephone and tell you. But one of the reasons they create bad SNR data isn't this L1 thing I was telling you about. It's because they mixed up the columns when they wrote the Rhinox translator. So if you go into the L1 column, you get the L2 SNR data. And if you go to the, I, I mean, it's just crap, right? I mean, it's just kind of nonsense crap. So every receiver manufacturer could do a good job computing SNR. And it's not what they sell. And I think some receiver manufacturers, the person on board that wrote their algorithms that day was a better programmer than other days. And, you know, and here we are. So that's my theory, but I haven't named a single receiver manufacturer, nor will I. I think some of the noise issues that bothered me when we ran PBO H2O, and remember PBO H2O, all the receiver antennas were about two meters tall, was all that you know, kind of clutter at the frequencies below a meter. But the good thing is, if you are high, and a lot of the sea level antennas are taller than that, you can kind of avoid that, right? You can just mask it out. Um, so I don't discourage people from using that receiver manufacturer at all. It's been, we've gotten great results with that data. Just be aware that not all noise is created equal. And I've had, Great results from the GLONASS and Galileo and GPS from many receiver manufacturers. Just, I think only two of them I consider to be not good enough for me. I think that's about it, unless someone or anyone is welcome to raise their hand or just start speaking. Hi, this is Neil again. <laughs> yeah, okay. I will see your picture if you're going to be talking. Are you? No, I'm just kidding. You don't have to. I'm, I'm, I'm having an ugly day. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, the uh, the sub daily plots that were shown. Um, does that take the timing? Because uh, I hadn't. Uh, I may, maybe I didn't pay attention to it before. But does it take the timing of when the signal, the reflector height was calculated, and then it reports it that individual time of the day? So it, it's not like it's segmenting the day on the hours. It's actually just putting a timestamp on that. It's UTC. Uh, it's whatever's in the results file. So the results file have UTC hour, right? It, it, down to the decimal, right? Or sure. minute, down to the minute. Now, can we create an hourly file? Sure but you'd want to do a tidal estimation or a smoother. Mm -hmm. I mean, this comes up to the next section, actually, which I people aren't going to ask other questions. You might as well just go straight to it. I'll do the share screen because it answers Neil's question, I think, a little bit anyway. All right, share. <clears throat> We're almost done here. Very exciting. Uh, play. Oh, I have stupid things like that. All right, well, where on this was I talking about? Yeah, we are working with community members. Can you guys see this? Am I showing something real? Yes. Okay. Yes. You see where it says, we are working with community members to include various published models for smoothing sub-daily estimates, primarily for sea level. So, well, I wouldn't even say primarily, entirely for sea level. So that would put out hourly values, right? Or 15 minute values or whatever you want. Um, if you're going to go to the process of estimating the reflector height correction, you're going to want a smooth model anyway. It's just very helpful. A lot of tide gauge people don't like that the tide gauge data are when the reflection happens. 
<laughs> I'm like, well, all right. <laughs> so, uh, I, I see some value in that. And so we could put out, I don't know that we would put out, well, frankly, if you're smoothing, you can put out a value every six minutes, just like Noah. But I think you should be judicious in that. You don't, you know, if you have a site that's suboptimal, it only has 10 reflections a day. You don't want to be smooth into that for 24 hours and acting like you've done something profound. So you want to be careful. And uh, I think we'll definitely try to do that for, you know, the people that want a normal looking time gauge uh, time series. But right now the sub daily model really concatenates the file and makes an attempt to remove outliers and it uh, does a RH dot correction. It removes frequency biases and things like that. So it's not done by any, it's not done. You know, we're year one of a three year grant. So I feel like we've done a ton, but we aren't done. Uh, and this actually is 2022 stuff coming up. I just wanted to tell you, I don't think there are hydrologists on here that do soil moisture because I made it very clear we, we don't have code that does that, but we will add it. It is on the to-do list. Uh, we're not going to do research on it though. We're just going to port our MATLAB code so that it works with this new package. Um, we have our SWE code in MATLAB as well, which we will port. I hope there's interest. I don't want to waste my time porting code people won't use, but I put that out there. It'd be nice if people raise their hand and say, yes, I like sweet. Um, I'm not gonna support vegetation code here. I am working with a colleague uh, who's interested in it, but I haven't really gotten much positive feedback from ecologists. So I think there's been more interest in snow and sea level and soil moisture. I like the vegetation stuff, but you know, you have to think about what that community wants. And they really do use satellite data a lot. In situ data, not so much. Um, we are gonna make a better SNR format, but of course, once you do that, you have to make your code backwards compatible. So it's, a, you know, it's a non-trivial effort to add a format, but then allow old formats. So we wanna be careful, but the main thing we need is a header. And the current format for SNR data was a format I created in 2004 for a homework assignment for grad students. So, you know, no thought went into it. And my only definition of a useful format at that point was it could be, at, you could load it in MATLAB using load. And that is why everything in that format is a number. Because if you have everything in that format is a number, you can load without any effort. And that's the only reason the way it is. If I put a header, well, okay, I should have had a header, but it was a homework assignment. So anyway, I'm now paying the price 17 years later. So if you are interested in using this code with NMEA, uh, we don't really need your help with that because I've had two colleagues give us code that can be added for that. I'm not sure how many people use NMEA, but that part, I think we're okay. I think we're okay with the smoothing. Hopefully I've had one person who's gonna to try to get me something by Thanksgiving. Um, as far as doing title estimation, you know, coefficients, uh, I don't feel like that's my job, but I would like to have one that's in Python and would do the reflector height correction simultaneously. And I know that Simon Williams has that in MATLAB and he's made it open source and I've already ported it. So I will add it at some point, um, but I haven't had time in the last few weeks. And we are, will of course put in the antenna phase center correction, but there's really not much point in doing that until we have a better format that has a header. And the other way we can of course track the header information is the same way that geodesists do is they have an antenna receiver file. You know, not, they're not really looking at the individual Rhinex files, Normally, for the networks, they basically have an external file that they keep track of. So I'm not really sure how that will end up because we're not there yet. So we'll, we'll do our best. But this is sort of on our to-do list. And um, I guess I would say now we should open it up to questions and comments. Do you guys think, Kelly and Tim? 
I see someone, uh, Sarah has their hand up. Sure. Hello. Uh, thank you. Hi. <laughs> uh, sorry for my English. I tried to make a question in a good way. <laughs> well, it is not exactly a question. It's my, uh, more like share my experience because I can do all the homeworks and I get results and I get the nice pictures or, or um, figures. But um, I tried to do something with my old data and I can I cannot get any result. It is something crazy. Then I need to to hear something about how can I um, move to get something because I'm trying with three different stations. And for example, I can get a very good uh, signal for one of, of them in a in a port. It, well, I don't know if it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but it is when I check the azimuth. The only azimuth that I get results is in the in the um, it is not on the water. It is in 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 the soil. Then I don't know how to manage all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then maybe you can give me an advice. <laughs> well, I I think what you're asking probably maybe in a way is to show more failures or <laughs> to show more examples of you know. Right, I, I, I know it. Did you try it in Acapulco Harbor? It is in Acapulco Yates. And Acapulco. the Acapulco Yates is the name of the of the place. It, it is different like Acap the other GPS station Acapulco <laughs> because this Acapulco Yates is- way up in the, Is it really tall or is it? Uh, no, it's it, it is in the. Um, oh, is that uh, a park club? In in exactly exactly. Oh, well, you know, just using the word yacht is very disturbing. <laughs> no, okay. because I, I I'm serious. Uh, so that's a very old Aztec. I. Uh, and it, but it is pretty close to the shore. It just might not work because there are boats. I. That, 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 that's my number one. I mean, and, and I've been doing this a while, but still friends of mine will send me their failures. And, you know, one time all I did, Sarah Yvonne, was I opened up Google Earth because, you know, the web app just shows you whatever Google Earth is giving you. I don't even know how they pick it. You know, they decide this is a good day. But then you can do Google Earth and you can look at different days. Have you guys ever done that? Where Anyway, so I'm clicking on different days and you're realizing it's really cloudy <laughs> around the world. And he was telling me that, you know, he got really bad results this one month. And I looked, there was this big, huge container ship <laughs> right in front of his site. I'm not saying that's your problem. Um, I actually think the best way to help possibly is to show more difficult sites. But I don't wanna start with difficult. I wanna start with easy. That's like, start with lakes. Don't do tides until you can do lakes. Um, and then, uh, but if you give me your data, I can look at it. I mean, I looked at data for someone who had a site in the Himalayas, which just had too many rocks. It was just surrounded, you know, it had rocks. It was rough. It was, you know what I mean? It wasn't a nice field. So for Snow, that was the problem. Uh, for Neil, I looked at his and I'm like, oh, you're facing north. So, I mean, I think we need more feedback of difficult sites, but if you can't run the software, you'll never get to the difficult sites. So it's a, I think maybe we just need to add more, maybe in between sites, sites that might work, might not work. I mean, I don't know. But if you send me a Rhinox file, I will look at it. Sure. I guess the problem with this station is the mass elevation max. Um, I think it is the receiver is configured to um, maybe ten or more degrees. Oh, no way, like no I think, but but I I don't I am not pretty sure. <laughs> it, it is my guess because Neil, turn off your muting and tell tell Sarah Yvonne the first thing I told you when I met you about MDAI. Uh, cut the trees down um, aggressively. That's what I remember. <laughs> I said after the trees. <laughs> um, maybe I didn't learn my lesson. Remove your elevation mask. 
Oh, that's right. Yes, that was it was a default because it's just a legacy of feeling like uh, we surveyors have to put elevation masks on everything. Well, and son, he had 10 degrees. I told him to change it. That's right. I have to ask to the manager network to do that. <laughs> but the old, all the old data, I think I shared the data with you and you can give me um, uh, more sense. <laughs> I'm sorry. I won't look at data with that has an elevation mask of 10 degrees. I'm sorry. I am not pretty sure. I, I don't know if there is a problem. It's my guess. But one site that I would, that's not true. Uh, I don't, do we have a use case for Palmer Station? I don't think so. But um, there's a publication on it that Felipe Navinsky and Sejad Tabibi wrote. And Palmer Station, Antarctica, you can't go below 10 degrees because if you do, you hit land so it's kind of like on this isthmus and you have to use between 10 and 16 degrees but uh, that's a pretty unusual site and it's pretty tall <clears throat> but if you have a 10 degree elevation mask i can just stop you right there <laughs> for sea level that's a deal breaker for soil moisture it might not be but you're not trying to do soil moisture so Sorry, sorry. No, thank you, thank you. Another, can you get another site on sea level that you know that you think might work? Or I, I have another station. It is from um, well, it's not mine, but it is from um, the people who I know in the Lazaro Cárdenas, Michoacán. Uh huh. And I think it is working. It is a little better. I can share the data, but. Uh, yeah, I, I don't get any good result, uh, at least with my... I, know. I, don't, I don't think it makes people feel better, but I get bad results all the time. I, I, I just try to figure out why, and I know that's what you're struggling with also. But I, um, like I said, that Alaska site, I never, I worked on, I created a seven-year time series and never understood why it was so hard because I didn't know people were parking next to the site because every time I looked at the pictures, it was like this beautiful desolate area. And, um, you know, even the places that work, there's a road there. Roads mean people can drive there. So, I mean, sure, maybe they can't park there, but, right? It's hard. Um, send me one of your sites. Why don't we get, if there's another, SWE so would be useful. Okay. So I want to say about SWE. Okay, we'll do that. We'll port that. But just so you know, because I had some questions about snowmelt. Uh, snowmelt, I mean, if you wanted to see if there was melting at the very top of your snow layer, just be aware that yes, there's an effect on the reflection from how wet that surface is. But there's also an effect when it's windy and the snow gets rough right? There's more than one thing causing that amplitude to change. And, and so it can be very tricky to get that surface melt value, very tricky. And um, we tried, Felipe Novinsky tried for over a year to come up with a algorithm for SWE based only on GPS data. And we gave up because we're mostly, almost entirely sensitive. The most this, the strongest signal is that reflection off the top. And even if you could tell something about the surface here, I can't see through snowpack or I don't see through snowpack. And the people that want to measure SWE are digging those pits and they do want it at every level. And we just can't do that. So the people that are going to give you SWE of a snowpack of a meter, I think they really need to bury their antennas and look at signal attenuation if they want to use GPS. And I don't know any geodesists who deliberately bury their GPS antennas in snowpack. So it's definitely going to be something you're not going to share the sensor with somebody else, right? So we'll add this. So what we did is we developed a density model that we multiply by the snow depth to give you SWE. But as you saw, it was successful. So that would be for the seasonal people. It's not for ice sheets. Snowmelt in Greenland, I think there's something there, but we need to talk offline because it's a pretty, it's a pretty specific application. 
And I don't think, you know. Anyway, so Bradley, sure, why don't you talk? You raise your hand, say something. Uh, Bradley Danielson, can you ask the question, uh, unmute yourself? Because his mic is not working. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. You could type the question, I guess. I don't know. That's kind of... Um, is there another question while Bradley's uh, typing? Any, um, so we got the statistics on who's using the Docker. So that was good to know, because that took some effort. Feedback on using GFZ Rhinox for concatenating. Well, uh, Melissa, one, one thing, Christine, just before we leave, and I'm just saying this so we don't forget, is uh, Melissa asked that we see if we could get people to turn on their camera to take a group photo screenshot of the, yeah. uh, the users, <laughs> the people here. But we just need to do that before we leave, so. It's fine with me, I don't, yeah. It looks like Brad, Bradley's got his question in the chat now. Is there, a pra is there a practical minimum observation time that will work with this method? i.e. at some sites on glaciers, we run 90 minute duration observations as a power saving strategy. Is this even worth trying? Is it 90 minutes per day? Uh, yes. So yeah, since the tracks only take 20 to 15 to 20 minutes, yeah. The answer is yes, it's worth trying. Um, how rough is it? Uh, that'd be a question. So I've seen some glaciers where I would just say, don't bother. I would point out that there's tons of data from Thwaites Glacier that no one is bothering to analyze. So anybody in the cryosphere community that wants to look at snow accumulation from the Thwaites Glacier uh, data set, it's there for the asking. It's all publicly archived, LTHW, UTHW, it is uh, highlighted on my web app. Actually, I guess we could ask questions. I'll get to you, Neil, but did, did anybody use the web app? Did they find it useful that you could, you know, not install the code and just get an answer? It's like Neil gives a thumbs up. Yeah, okay. So. And there's a couple of yeses in the chat. Okay. Um, you know, you can actually run that without looking at the visual. You can just run it from the command line if you use curl. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, some details there. But, um, you know, I wrote it without realizing that. So that was, you can do things without realizing they're useful. <laughs> All right, Neil, what was your question? Uh, so the going back to the one that I nearly asked before was about solar activity and how that impacts uh, reflectometry. Because I know in the multi-frequency scenario, trying to get a position, usually that mitigates for most activity. Yeah. Um, but how does it impact this? Yeah. No, you know, I, one time I, there was some ionospheric activity I saw in a site in New Mexico. Uh, it was just fun to look at. Um, it was very <laughs> high frequency though. Uh, so it didn't, you know, and we're looking at these very slow 15 to 20 minute tracks. And so the high frequency things didn't affect us. I did see some scary SNR data ones from the equator. Oh my God, I was really frightened because I thought, oh my God, maybe we can't even use this technique near the equator. <laughs> but since then I've seen good data. So maybe I just got a bad day, like who knows? So uh, yeah, your solar thing is not a bad uh, 
guess when you were talking about, you know, that, but um, just not, that I have not seen enough of an effect anytime. I mean, things go wrong sometimes. Sometimes it's snow, sometimes, sometimes the telemetry is bad. Sometimes the power supply goes bad. I mean, yeah, I mean, there could be some, definitely some ionosphere issues on occasion, but I, I have not seen it except that scary site in South America. Um, but, you know, at the same time, I've got those colleagues in Singapore that have shown beautiful results near the equator. So, hmm. yes. Uh, your last five minutes. <laughs> I have like five cups of coffee today. <sighs> Why don't we try to get some of these screenshots going here so that I can <laughs> I'll dress up. get that done. I'll turn my camera on. Oops. So I'm in the picture too. <laughs> so I think we will. Um, we thought about uh, allowing this before the class. I'm glad we didn't because look, we barely got through the easy cases today. But I do think uh, we should let everybody have the opportunity to send one file <laughs> and we'll give it a look, right? Um, but maybe what we'll ask you to do is to maybe give us a use case feedback, right? You type up where are the site's from, maybe. You know, like the use cases we have, we usually describe the site. Anyway, I'll let uh, Shelly, go ahead. Sorry, did I screw that up? Melissa, Shelly, Melissa, Shelly, is there a Shelly there? We're good, I got it all. <laughs> anyway, we, we might try to get um, people to submit their files and see, we'll see if we can try to figure out what's wrong with them. I'm pretty sure I won't look at any of them if you won't send me a picture. But if it's a 10 degree, Elevation mask, Sarah Vaughn, you just can't do that to me. <laughs> That's too mean. Well, there is a question in the uh, chat about the Slack and, and staying active. And yes, it will stay active for a little while. <laughs> um, I didn't answer Slack, not because I'm incapable of using an app, but it was just hard enough to get the lectures together and uh, to make the videos. So I let uh, Tim and Kelly answer the questions uh, in Slack. I'll try to pay a little more attention now that um, this part is over. Uh, the YouTube channel will stay and, um, you know, UNAVCO is going to kindly archive these, uh, these lectures and uh, we'll see where we go. Um, I hope it was helpful. But we can definitely leave the Slack open. I think she says, having no responsibility for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, we can keep it open. I mean, I've been on Slack channels before where they kind of died, but this one's a little different in that it's a science Slack. All right, I say we declare success I told my husband to make me a margarita, but yet I don't see it here. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, very much. It was Thanks great. to all colleagues from mm -hmm. UNAFCO. Thank you very much. Thank you from INGV in Italy.